Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all new edition of the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What's happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Pad, what's going on this week? Uh, a whole lot in sports, but more importantly, got to wish a happy birthday to my girlfriend, Liz Bailey. Happy birthday, babe. Yeah, shout out to Liz Bailey. Yeah. So definitely go out and celebrate after you listen to this podcast, though, because we definitely have a lot to talk about in the land of sports, and we definitely want to interact with you after the show, so make sure to swing on over to odphpodcast.com. Join in the conversation on the social media accounts. They're all right there on the front page along with the Public Store link, along with the Patreon link. Shout out to our amazing patrons. They're the best. One tier, $2 a month, and a whole lot of content on the way. Parlay Points blog section, the classified section, which has friends of the show, such as 3FN Podcast, the directory. Pat, how many providers are we on? Uh, 120,000. Sounds about right to me. The music section. If it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, it can be found at odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media to use the hashtag ODPHpod. Let's kick off this sports edition like we always do during the National Football League season, and we have to recap the week that was with the locks and leaps. So, Pad, kick us off. Yeah, I'm going to start with one of my locks, and that was the Kansas City Chiefs to beat the Houston Texans, which they did by the final score of 30-24. to Uh, Patrick Mahomes, 36 of 41 for 336 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Davis Mills, 12 of 24 for 121 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Royce Freeman led Houston for rushing, 11 carries, 51 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, Isaiah Pacheo led it for Kansas City with 15 carries, 86 yards, no touchdowns. Travis Kelsey, surprised to no one, led uh, Kansas City in receiving 10 catches, 105 yards, no touchdowns. Chris Moore led for Houston with four catches, 42 yards, and no touchdowns. So the question I have here is, Kansas City got taken to overtime by Houston. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about this? If I'm Kansas City, I'm a little nervous because Houston, worst record in the NFL, uh, won 12 and one. Uh, Not good. You know, they got Davis Mills at starting quarterback. Who I'm sorry. Name me a person who has Davis Mills on their fantasy football lineups at this point in the season. You know, and then you also just look at the folks on, on their offensive weapons, which, I mean, let's face it, you know, no disrespect to them, but Royce Freeman hello who Mm -hmm. you know the uh davis mills also uh second leading rusher for houston then you've you've got a couple other guys but i don't outside of jeff driscoll i don't recognize any of the other names and then you look at their receivers okay uh, you know chris moore who amari rogers who Mm -hmm. you know i almost mistook it for amari cooper i went wait what is cooper doing on the texans but no it's rogers right you know jordan akins who Rex Burkhead, I recognize, but he he was a former Patriot and a former Buffalo Bill, but he's never been that so, – he's, he's been an okay running back. Okay at best, but, you know, not, but not, not a game changer. Yeah, not your number one guy. You know, he's more of a, a receiving running back than anything. He only had two catches, 17 yards, no touchdowns. He was targeted four times. But, the, you know, they've got Brevin Jordan who had a target, you know, one catch, nine yards. Phil Dorsett, who I also recognize, former Patriot, but, again, no catches, no yards, one target. So – there's nothing on this offense that is like, yo, I need to pick up that guy in fantasy next year. Mm-hmm. Or, yo, keep an eye on this guy. He, This guy hits the free agent market. This is your next big contract. Yeah. This is your next big star in insert team here. That's just not jumping out at me, you know, which is just the case of where Houston is at this point. You know, they're in rebuilding. You know, so the fact that you've got Kansas City who – Admittedly, the running game isn't what it was. Sure. You know, it's still decent. You know, Pacheco had 86 yards. Jarek McKinnon, 52 yards. Patrick Mahomes, 33 himself. Uh, Sky Moore had 12. And then Ronald Jones had six. So the tr- running game's not bad, but it's not what it used to be. And then, you know, the same can be said receiving. I mean, you had 105 yards from Kelsey, which he can do in his sleep. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a typical stat line. You know, Juju Smith-Schuster, 10 catches, 88 yards, no touchdowns. Jarek McKinnon had 8 catches, 70 yards, 1 touchdown. 
Noah Gray got some catches in there. Mark Marquez Valdez Scantling, 26 re, uh, yards receiving. Pacheo had 11 yards receiving. Uh, Kadarius Tony f- five yards receiving. And then you had Justin Watson and Jody Fortson, both with no yards receiving, although they did get targeted two times and one times respectively. You know, so it's it's not exactly the Kansas City of a couple of years ago where it's like they've got a four-headed monster on that offense where any of those guys can just drop on you. Mm-hmm. they got some decent players, but this is still a team that is leaps and bounds better than Houston. And so the fact that it went to overtime, I'm not exactly like smashing the panic button, but yeah, I'm a little nervous. Kansas City got caught slipping. That's the honest truth. They were looking past them, and they – did not take Houston seriously, and it almost came back to haunt them in a very big way. As a Bills fan, I was hoping that this happened. I really was. Because when you take a team lightly, we talked about this last week with Dallas. If you take a team lightly this late in the season and you need to clinch home field advantage Mm -hmm. or a number one seed, you cannot afford to have a hiccup like this. And like I said, they were caught slipping, looking the other way, and they just almost slipped off the floor completely. They were absolutely embarrassed by this win. Right. And I know that sounds weird saying an embarrassing win, but it is exactly that. This team should not have been this close. No. Let alone you went to overtime with them. Yeah. Like, do you understand the gravity of the situation here? And I understand that they don't have Clyde Edwards-Hilaire in the backfield. Sure. That might hurt them a little bit on this offense, but this is still Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. That is the Chiefs' offense. The mm-hmm. running back is almost by committee at this stage. Yeah. But the fact that your defense let Davis Mills light you up, that that is a frightening stat to say. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry. Like, yeah. Houston is not good. So why were you you know allowing this to happen? And for Kansas City, I would be very concerned about this, that if your team is losing focus, mm-hmm. This could be a serious problem. Yeah, and I mean, I'm looking at their schedule. I, it's entirely possible and plausible that they were looking past uh, their opponents because I'll get to their schedule in a minute. But just looking at the standings, you know, while they have clinched the div- they have clinched the division, everything else in terms of seeding in the AFC is still up for grabs. Mm-hmm. Nobody has the number one seed. Nobody has the number two seed. You know, so I looking at the schedule, I think it's entirely possible they got caught slipping because I'm sorry. No offense to Davis Mills, but he's in his second year out of Stanford, and he was a third-round pick. The man's not exactly scaring me. If if I'm a defensive coordinator, going holy shit, we got to you know, this ain't exactly Peyton Manning in his prime, where it's like, all right, this guy's a cerebral assassin when it comes to picking apart defenses. Mm-hmm. You know, this this is Davis Mills we're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, this is just ridiculous that this game was even this close. And like I said, Kansas City got caught looking past them. Mm-hmm. That's the only way I can describe it. Like they they slipped and they fell. Like I'm sorry, you know, this is. Something for good teams you can't yeah. afford to do. And this is yeah. something that will be haunting them a little bit. And is it a, a season breaker? By no means. But this late in the season, when you have to beat the Buffalo Bills mm-hmm. and have a better record than them going into the playoffs, every game matters that much more. Because I will tell you this, not as a Bills fan, but as an honest fan, if they have to travel to Buffalo, oh. they're not winning they're not going to beat the Bills to go to the Super Bowl. If they have home field advantage, they have a way better shot. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. But you can't tell me that they can go up to Buffalo and hang up there in the cold weather Mm -hmm. because it's going to be miserable up there. It doesn't matter if it's snow or not. Yeah. And say they're going to be able to pull off a win. No offense to anyone in Buffalo, but just the weather this time of year, no matter what it's doing, sucks. Oh, it's absolutely awful. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's, It's great. If you uh, are extremely uh, crazy to sit in the stands for games like this, yeah, and for the Bills, they're conditioned to play in this weather. Like oh, yeah. th- you know, they're used to this. So this is not going to phase them. Kansas City, though, they're not going to be ready for this. Like they no. they will show up, but I'm going to say right now they don't. They're not going to win. They're definitely not going going to pull this off. Right. So, looking at the season moving forward, you have to say with Kansas City, you're lucky you got out of this one with a win mm-hmm. because if you lost. That gave the Bills a big cushion that they could have used. But now that you have a tied record, you have to win outright. Is this going to happen? 
That's a good question. Maybe, uh, because for the last three games of the season, the Kansas City Chiefs are playing the Seattle Seahawks at home uh, this upcoming week. That is on Christmas Eve. Uh, then they play the Denver Broncos at home uh, on New Year's Day. Uh, and then for the final game of the season, Week 18 on January 8th, they play the Las Vegas Raiders in Vegas. Yeah, so, and I'm going to say this. I don't doubt the Raiders making some noise there for oh, that yeah. final game. They're still in playoff contention. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little later. And then just to be fair, Houston has Tennessee uh, on the road, Jacksonville at home, and then Indianapolis on the road to close out their season. The only game there that really I think matters is the Jacksonville one. Probably. Because Jacksonville could sneak into the AFC South division title. Could be. With a little luck. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but that one is probably the only meaningful game. Let's face it, the Indianapolis one is not. (laughs) We'll get to them. Yeah, we'll get to that in a bit, but that doesn't matter. In Tennessee, anything could happen there, but I don't think it's going to be that impactful as much as the Jacksonville game. Just saying. And then we're going to go to my leap. Uh, One of the leaps I chose was the Detroit Lions to beat the New York Jets, uh, which they did by the final score of 20 to 17. Jared Goff, 23 of 38 for 252 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Zach Wilson uh, starting for Mike White, who was not cleared uh, to play this game. Uh, 18 of 35 for 317 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Uh, Zonovan Knight led the New York Jets with rushing uh, 13 carries, 23 yards, no touchdowns. DeAndre Swift led for Detroit with eight carries, 52 yards, no touchdowns. Amon Ra St. Brown uh, led Detroit for receiving seven catches, 76 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, And then Garrett Wilson led for New York with four catches, 98 yards, and no touchdowns. Well, the big takeaway here is the Jets' playoff chances are dwindling mm-hmm. with Zach Wilson at the helm. Yep. This was a game they could have won, but Zach Wilson's not going to get him over the hump. He's not the guy. I'm sorry. Nope. nope. He's just not going to lead your team anywhere. Granted, he got <laughs> 300 yards on Detroit. Right. But I want to stress this. He got it on Detroit, mm-hmm. whose defense is, is, improving. is improving but is not good. No. Because the one thing that the Lions do better than more than teams, and they don't get enough credit for, yeah, they can put points on the board. Oh yeah, they just can't keep it off the board. Yeah, yeah, that's the issue. So if you get into a shootout with them, they're going to be able to hang with you. Yeah. In this situation, the Jets' offense didn't do enough to take over this game. Right. So Detroit, this was almost—I don't want to say an easy win, but the score is a little. Not as reflective as the game really was. I mean, to me, it's almost similar to their game, what was it, last season against the Ravens, mm-hmm. where they were close, the Lions went up, and the, or they tied it or whatever. And then the Ravens went down the field in Detroit, mind you, and Justin Tucker broke the NFL record for longest field goal. Right. You know, th- and that's why we say Detroit is good in that it can put up points and it can go into a shootout with you. But in terms of stopping the other team from scoring, yeah, a little bit uh, leaves a little to be desired. Exactly. This is going to be a situation that Detroit winds up getting that last playoff spot, which they are in contention for. They're going to need to find some way, somehow, and fast to be able to stop some teams from scoring because you're going to be facing the upper echelon of the division. They just need some help. They need some help, but it's not to say it's out of the realm of thought. Like This is how crazy this NFL season has been. There's not really a top seven that is a lock right now Mm -hmm. this late in the season. And every game matters that much more. Like that's why we we put the emphasis on the Kansas city win, right? That's big. We put the emphasis on this game because this is a big game for both teams. This is, I don't want to say it completely ruins the jets playoffs chances, but it kind of pushes everything a little more. I mean, it doesn't help Uh, for the Detroit lions currently in in the NFC. They're currently the nine seed uh, with the Seattle Seahawks ahead of them uh, with the same record. Uh, Seattle wins the tiebreaker over Detroit based on head to head win percentage. And then you've got the Washington commanders at the seven seed. Uh, And for the jets, they currently sit at also the nine seed uh, ahead of the Patriots or behind the Patriots who have the same record. Uh, but they also win the tie break over the Jets based on head-to-head win percentage, and then the Miami Dolphins at the number seven position. So mm. both both teams in a position, but they need a lot of help. Yeah, so we'll definitely have to watch that moving forward, though. Yeah, uh, and for the schedules, the remainder of the year, you've got the Detroit Lions who play the Carolina Panthers in Carolina on Christmas Eve. They play the Chicago Bears at home on, uh, what is it, New Year's Day. And then uh, the last week of the season, they're on the road in Green Bay playing the Packers on January 8th. 
uh, and for the Jets, they have the Jacksonville Jaguars at home this coming Sunday. God, that's going to suck for Jacksonville. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that that is on Thursday, mind you, the twenty second. Uh, you've got the they then they go on the road to Seattle on uh, New Year New Year's Day, and then the, the, uh, they close out the year. Ooh, this will be nice for them. They close out the year on the road, January eighth in Miami. Yeah, that is going to be an interesting game that I think is going to play a bigger factor than people realize too, because Miami, even though they took the L this week, and we'll talk about that, is really making a run to solidify a good playoff spot. Mm-hmm. The Jets, I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. I, I just don't see it this season. You need to upgrade a quarterback. And unfortunately, if Mike White's not in there, this team isn't going to move forward. It's just, I'm sorry, he's not going to happen. But on the flip side for Detroit, they have a chance to win outright. It's, it's a chance. It is a chance. It's not a great chance, so I'm not going to say fully, oh, lock it in. They're going to make a run. But those last two games of the season, I think, are going to be more telling than we like to give credit for. Mm-hmm. Because what we have to look at is they have to face Chicago, yep. and you have to really say Justin Fields is carrying that team on his back. Oh, God, yeah. So as long as he's in there, they've got a chance every game. It's also a divisional game. Yeah, so division, we've talked about this many times. If this is division, it doesn't matter about the records. It depends who's got the heart. The only game I think that's going to give them real problems is is Green Bay. Yeah. Because if Aaron Rodgers has a chance to get to the playoffs with as bad as that team has been, and Lord, has it been bad. Oh, yeah. They're currently 6-8. and Yeah. This is not typical Aaron Rodgers football. No. But if he still has a slim chance of hope to get in there, that Detroit game could be one to really keep an eye on, and that could be a deciding factor for a last playoff spot. Could be. You know, just it all depends on how everything shakes up, but there's so many moving parts. Like, that's the one thing that we can't emphasize enough. There's so many moving factors that are going on that one team could sneak in there completely blindsiding everybody. Oh, God, yeah. And one team that we think is just a surefire bet is going to fade out quick. Well, that's the crazy thing is between the New York Giants, who are at the sixth seed with 8-5-1, and one, there is a difference of them to the, what is a 7 8 9 10 11 seed, which is the Carolina Panthers. There is a difference of three games. Yeah. In terms of wins, it's it's wild. No, it's absolutely crazy to talk about. Speaking of those Giants, though, let's talk about them. Because you and I both had that as a leap. Yes, we did. Uh, And the Giants uh, somehow pulled off the win. Somehow is the key word, but we'll talk about this one. Uh, They won by the final score of 20-12. to Uh, Danny Dimes, 21-32, 160 yards, no touchdowns or interceptions. Taylor Haneke, uh, 17-29, 249 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions. Brian Robinson Jr. led Washington for rushing with 12 carries, 89 yards, no touchdowns. Saquon Barkley led for the Giants with 18 carries, 87 yards, one touchdown. Richie James uh, led with four uh, catches, 42 yards, no touchdowns. And then Jahan Dotson led for Washington with, holy shit, four catches, 105 yards, one touchdown, Average 26.3 yards per catch, and his longest was 61 yards. God damn. No, nah, he was having a game, but this team... Giants secondary, where you at? Yeah, I was going to say, this team really did not impress me as saying a playoff team and getting a win by a lot of luck in their favor. Like, the amount of things that went in the Giants' favor, especially with the officiating, mm-hmm. was astonishing. Now, I always hate saying it comes down to referee decisions, but in this case, it literally did. Mm. Because when you look at how this game was going, and the, granted, the Giants were up 14-3. to three. We forget about this. Thibodeau had a great uh, recovery for a fumble to score on the touchdown. So they were looking in great position going into halftime. Right. Then you go into the second half, and Washington was scrapping, which we knew they were going to do. It's a division game. It's what they do. Exactly. They don't win pretty. They don't win ugly. They just scrap. Like if they it's, had a better quarterback, I think they'd win more games. Yeah, because, I mean, Heineke is doing what he can, but he's not the guy. Mm-hmm. But they have a lot of holes in Washington, too, that they're starting to improve, but, you know, it's not to say they're going to be ma- making any noise anytime right, soon. I mean, right. they got a lot of other issues off <laughs> off the field, On so and speak. off the field. Yeah, the, it's just Washington, I'm not holding my breath for them to get in. Even though the season, the fact they're still 500 – is a win. Yeah. So, you know what? Kudos to them. But when you start taking a look at what happened in that final moments where Washington was making the drive late and you had the weird 
offsides penalty when uh, Terry McLaurin was trying to say he was on the line of scrimmage, and they said he wasn't. Oh, okay. And he checked in twice. Okay. No, he was checking in twice, and there was a little confusion there. Right. Which I don't understand what was going on there, because if you're checking in, that should be a clear cut. Are you there or not? And I thought the one ref said he had to move up. Mm. He didn't move up. Mm. Like, this is just my vantage point of this. So I could be wrong about this, but watching this all unfold, it was like this is the worst time this could happen of a mental lapse like this. Now, this did play a factor because it did take away a momentum for Washington. Then you go to the final play, and it was one of the most egregious pass interference no calls I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. The giant defender pretty much had almost a rear naked choke. Oh, I saw the photo on of the, this. On the Washington receiver. Yeah, I didn't watch him because I was watching Monday Night Raw, but I did see the photo of this. Yeah, that was pretty blatant. Yeah, I believe it was on Curtis Samuel there. And it was just out of control. So, yeah. like, I'm sitting there going, like, are you kidding me? Like, what are we doing here? NFL refs doing like the NBA refs. Well, you know, that's the one thing that you have to say is the consistency this season mm-hmm. has been lacking. Yeah. And if you're going to call a game one way or the other, like if you're going to be very hands-on, very technical, sure. Yeah. But do it from kickoff to final whistle. Yep. You can't go and do it on a per-case basis is what is appearing to me. Mm -hmm. So I'll say the allegedly there, but this is my eye test saying this. You have to be consistent if you're calling. If you're not going to call anything, then don't call anything. Let everybody play. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But don't call back plays earlier in the game in the first half and then all of a sudden swallow the whistle in the second half. That doesn't average out. I'm sorry, you can't make you can't have a makeup call like that, especially that late, which did impact the game tremendously. You can't deny that. So now Washington is subsequently out of the playoffs. I don't they're I mean they're mathematically they're still in it. Yeah, mathematically sure, but mathematically, I mean, a lot of luck is involved. Uh, they're currently the seventh seed uh, behind the Giants, the sixth seed, who are eight five and one. The Commanders are seven six and one, so they're still in it. Still in it, but I don't think they're going to make the run this late in the season, though. I mean, because you have other teams catching on fire, and that team is like that whole division is kind of very very tight mm-hmm. in as far as the standing. So anything could happen. But a loss like this, you need to win late. They didn't, and they literally had the game taken away from them. But then again, on the other side of the ball, the Giants, you're up 14-3 to at halftime. Mm-hmm. I understand it's division, but your secondary looked atrocious Yeah, in that second half. Yeah. The fact that you let Washington come back, score nine on you, is very telling. And the fact they should have scored in that final drive is all you need to say. You got one away from the away from them because of the referees. It, this is not a good win. This did not strike any confidence in me right. watching you say, like, this team is really going to make a run late. I know Saquon Barkley had a great second half. I will I will give him that. He might get, he, he, you know, he might get comeback player of the year. He should. I, I can see it. Well, I will say I, I will say this. I know I'm very critical about Brian Dabble. Sure. I will, I will say he's got this team motivated. They do play very hard for him. Yeah. And I think the person that has benefited the most has been Saquon, Saquon Barkley. Saquon, because having, being a Penn State football fan i watched saquon in, in college electric shit like especially mm-hmm. when, when he was on kickoff returns the the transition from the college game to the pro game i get is difficult but there are some guys that like you watch in college and go yeah this is going to translate yeah and i wa- remember watching saquon going yeah this this ought to translate pretty goddamn well and the fact that it's taken this long is mind-blowing but i think it goes to what you said is is the system dabbles got running and it's working for him yeah. You know, but I'm I'm concerned with the Giants because for a team that was riding high in, in the toast of the town and then the toast of the five boroughs, you know, in New York City, they've they've almost come back down to earth since the bye week and they beat Houston. You know, they came out of the bye week week nine, they beat Houston. Then they all right, listen, they technically lost four in a row. One of those games is a tie, but hey, it ain't a win. It right, it's it, a loss. It's not adding to the win column, so it's a loss. You lost to Detroit, who's on the fringe, might make it, might not make it, depending on how the dice fall. Mm-hmm. You've got Dallas, who, listen, Dallas is good, but they've they've obviously had some hiccups here the a last A very couple. shaky team right now. You tied the Commanders, bum, 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 bum. who you just barely beat by a score and some uh, arguable help this week, you know, and then you lost to the Eagles. You know, so this is a team that for as hot as they were looking, you know, being uh what was it, six and two going into the bye week and then seven and two coming out coming out of their game out of the bye week, 
come down to earth a little bit. Yeah, this is very humbling for the Giants. And I think if you're already booking your Super Bowl ticket, uh, you might still get a refund. Yeah, you can still probably get a refund for this. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't see this team doing it this year. I think they've taken steps in the right direction. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. but And I don't care how anybody is trying to spill this because I've had people DM and hit me up as I'm walking through uh, town, so, mm-hmm. so, so to speak. Say that Daniel Jones is not the problem. Daniel Jones is fine. That he is the franchise. I sw- I what? I kid you not. I have had some messages come my way, and like I said, I've been walking through town, do my usual business, and I've actually been hit up by people. The fuck are they smoking? I want some. Legitimately, I've said that. Jesus, Daniel, what? Daniel Jones is not the problem. Devil has fixed him. There's a reason, folks. We call him Danny Dimes. It's not a term of endearment. Correct. And I literally have sat there and said, how are you going to tell me that he is your franchise guy? And they kind of, and the argument has always been like, well, you know, he's kind of had four different coordinators. But with Dabble, man, I'm seeing the signs. I'm sorry. He's not the guy. You need to temper the expectations here. Mm-hmm. He, I'm sorry. He, if he can't win in a shootout against the Commanders, yeah. bum, 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 bum. Well, a shootout and to where two weeks ago you tied them. Yeah. He's not the guy. Like, is he a serviceable backup? Uh, yes. He'll he'll get the job done for you. Admittedly, sometimes he'll lose those some of those jobs. But is this the guy to lead you to the, the promised land and another Super Bowl win? Absolutely fucking not. No. We always said it was a it was a reach when he was drafted so high. I fully think so because he falls in that uh, prototype that NFL coordinators really like the big build. We've seen this with Sam yeah, Darnold. Yeah. We've seen this with a few other quarterbacks that have been big names coming out of college, but what have they won in college? Oh, God, what was it? The one that's making the rounds on social media was either going into the game or after the game of Sam Darnold in his – in his uh, or no, Zach Wilson in his pro day. Yeah. Where he does the he, – he gets the ball from the center, rolls out, and then drops like a 70-yard dime. With nobody rushing him, nobody pressuring the defender. So, of fucking course he's going to make a 70-yard dime on a throw like that with no pressure. We're seeing how the pressure works with him in the NFL. Same with Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones, obviously a great quarterback or decent quarterback at Duke, but it's fucking Duke. Duke football. Duke football. <laughs> we want to stress. I'm saying not Duke, football. <laughs> not basketball. Shashevsky ain't exactly coaching the Duke football team. You know, but so obviously the level of talent when it comes to the ACC football is not exactly the class of ACC basketball mm-hmm. or some of the other Power Five conferences exactly. in, in, the, in the college football. So, you know, obviously he's good there. You get up to the major leagues where all of a sudden those guys you weren't facing week in and week out in college are all of a sudden going up against you, and all of a sudden the level of talent is that much higher, and you're not meeting it. Mm-hmm. This is something that we're seeing now more and more in the NFL. And I'm sorry, like it's no disrespect to any of the smaller schools, but the competition level is different. And that's something I think you know some of these re- recruiters or, or not recruiters, scouts and, and talent personnel, whatever, have have to keep in mind because we're seeing this a lot where these guys get taken high, first round, early second round, mid second round, whatever it is, and then they fizzle out because mm-hmm. oh they had phenomenal stats. Oh this this quarterback set of D three record you know passing yards and threw 700 touchdowns in a season okay but who the fuck was he going up against now i'm not saying like the alabamas but you have to throw them in there well yeah you have to look at the conferences you You have to look at the teams the lsu's the alabamas the texas's the usc's the ucla's you know what have you if they're going up against the citadel or you know, or Binghamton University, which for those who don't know, Binghamton University doesn't have a football team. Mm-hmm. But if it's going up against like Binghamton University or or some school that's like in the middle of nowhere you've never heard of, of course they're going to look good. They're a big fish in a small pond. Put that that fish in a large pond. All of a sudden they're a minnow. Yeah, not everybody is Brock Purdy coming out of Iowa State. <laughs> that's a a diamond goat. in the rough goat yeah which is a whole different ball of wax tom who <laughs> you're seeing the reincarnation of tom brady in some people's eyes not ours yet never I, heard of him but i will say this going back to the giants danny dimes is not the answer you just gotta get through the season and see what you have yep if you get to the playoffs that will be a big feather in the cap i'm not gonna say that's that's a big win but at the end of the day He's not going to get you there. This team is not going to go to the Super Bowl. I would be shocked if they did. 
but it would almost be in the sense of like when Eli was at quarterback. Right. That he'd always have a mediocre season, yep. Yep. get in the playoffs, and something would turn on. Unless that ghost comes and possesses him, I don't see how this last, is going to And last I checked, Eli Manning still alive. Yes. Uh, looking at the schedule for the remainder of the year, good Lord, this is going to get interesting. Uh, you have the New York Giants are on the road playing the Minnesota Vikings on a Saturday, December 24th. Uh, and then they are at home on uh, New Year's Day playing the Indianapolis Colts. And then they end the season. Good Lord, this crowd's going to be rowdy. On the road in Philly. The Philly game is the only one I worry about for them. And then for the Washington Commanders, also have an interesting schedule uh, because they are on the road playing the San Francisco 49ers this coming Saturday. That is Christmas Eve. Uh, they are uh, at home on New Year's Day playing the Cleveland Browns, and then they close the season out at home against the Wa- or excuse me against the Dallas Cowboys. Washington needs a lot of luck. I don't see them doing this. And for the Giants, I mean, they might get in there because of this win. Right. But I don't see them going that far. Giants, I think they win two of these games. They're good. Uh, Washington essentially needs to win out. Yeah, and I don't see that happening. Yeah. Sorry, just not going to happen. Yeah. Going to my lock, though, I took a roll of the dice. I knew it was going to be cold. And I knew that with Miami heading up north, anything could have been possible. This is true. And I knew this was a division game. This had a lot of playoff implications. And this is going to be one that is a great win for the Bills, but I would not exactly feel super confident. Mm-hmm. And I'll be honest about it. But, Pat, you got those stats up? Yeah, so the Buffalo Bills beat the Miami Dolphins by the final score of 32-29. to Josh Allen, 25-40, of 40, 304 yards passing, four touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Tua Tagovailoa, 17-30, of 30, 234 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Raheem Mostert, holy fuck, uh, 17 carries, 136 yards, no touchdowns. Josh Allen led for Buffalo, 10 carries, 77 yards, no touchdowns. Dawson Knox led Buffalo in receiving with six catches, 98 yards, one touchdown. I couldn't get two more yards. Uh, and then Jalen Waddell led Miami for receiving. What? Somebody other than Tyree Kill? Yeah. Uh, three catches. Well, fuck, that's why. Three catches, 114 yards, uh, and one touchdown. Mike McDaniel, the Miami Dolphins head coach, yep. called a perfect offense for this. Damn near. I'm going to say it right now. The Bills are lucky they got away with this one. They really are. Give the credit to the weather. Yeah, Morster, he did a phenomenal job running the ball, though. Averaged uh, eight yards a carry. Yeah. So when he is running and they were just going right to the outside, this was a page out of the Jets playbook. This is an area that the Bills have struggled with for years. Right. Run defense is going to break them in the playoffs. I understand Von Miller's not there, but somebody needs to step up and shut down the run. Well, and it's especially concerning because, as I mentioned, uh, Raheem had eight yards of carry. You also had Salvin Ahmed, Ahmed mm-hmm. uh, six carries, 43 yards. Uh, they're not good at math. That's 7.2 yards of carry. Uh, and then you also had Tua Tagovailoa had one carry, but also for seven yards, no touchdowns. So right there is three gentlemen all north of five yards. Uh, a carry. So essentially, no matter when the three of them carried the uh, ball, they were looking at at least second and three. Yeah, Mostert was just dominating. I was surprised they went away from him, to be honest with you. I understand later in the game, though, the Bills were making some plays, but this was a situation that this was a very scary situation for them. Their offense took a while to get going, but once it got going, it was rolling. So for anybody that was doubting the Bills were a Super Bowl team because their offense couldn't get the job done. They put up points. There's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. But the only problem that they're showing is the same one that has been haunting them for a while. If you can't get the run game going, you're not going to make it far in the playoffs. Right. And you can only rely on Josh Allen to do so much. Now, granted, what I will say, this is one of the things I love about Josh. He is willing to put the team on his back. He's willing to make plays happen when he can. He needs to be more careful with the football, though, if he's doing this. But he was making some runs that he needed to really get some yards and extend plays. He was being very smart with the ball. Right. This wasn't a situation like we saw earlier in the season where he's thrown into triple coverage and hoping something happens. Right. So I will say I was very happy with what I saw with him. Dawson Knox finally showed up, even though he dropped a couple wide open ones, which Mm. made that's that's a different story. But this team really hung in there, and once the bad weather happened, 
This is why we emphasized earlier with Kansas City. If you're not used to playing in cold, snowy weather, you're going to struggle. The Dolphins clearly did. And I understand that once the weather got bad, they weren't running as effectively. You saw the passing game started slowing down a bit, even though Waddle and Hill had good games. Hill did not look that impressive. He did catch a big pass, though, that really made up a lot of his yards. So I want to point that out. But once the weather turned, Miami struggled. And this is where the Bills excelled, which we all knew they were going to do. And I will say it got very interesting late because when the Bills made a crucial stop, when they finally had to, they went right down the field. Devin Singletary could have punched it in and given Miami about 40 seconds left, or no, less than 40 I'm going to say it was right around 30 seconds left. Sure. He went and he took a knee right down on the second yard line. He didn't realize that he needed to cross to the first to get a first down. Mm-hmm. But they did enough that they could set up for the field goal and kick the game and be done. Yeah. And it was smart. It was, I will say, one of the smarter two-minute drills I've seen in the Sean McDermott era. Because he does struggle managing that clock. So, yeah, if he's got one Achilles heel, that, that, that's one of them. It's a glaring one. But this is a very, very solid win for the Bills. Miami, this is a bad loss, but this is not a season breaker. No. But the problem that you have now is to win, if you have to go up north, you're going to struggle. If you could stay in the southern hemisphere where it's warm, you're okay. If they have to go to Kansas City, I think they can win, to be honest with you. But if they have to go through Buffalo again, they're not going to do it. Well, the saving grace uh, they've got this upcoming week because I'm looking at the Miami Dolphins schedule is they're at home this uh, coming Sunday. So while most of the North is going to freeze our fucking asses off, mm-hmm. uh, they are playing the Green Bay Packers at home. However, they do have to come North the week after because week 17, uh, so they got their the game against Green Bay, I should note, is on Christmas Day. Uh, they've got a game on week 17 on uh, New Year's Day up in New England playing the Patriots, so they'll freeze their asses off then. Uh, and then they close out the year uh, playing the New York Jets at home. As for the Buffalo Bills, uh, they are on the road. They are one of the aforementioned teams, I saw this this morning, that are going to freeze their fucking asses off, even though they're from Buffalo. I was going to say, but are they? Well, hold on, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they are playing the Chicago Bears on the road in Chicago. That is on uh, New Year, Christmas Eve, I should say. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is from Field Yates of ESPN. Uh, he tweeted out, quote, the current estimates for the feels-like temperature at kickoff of some of the outdoor games this Saturday. Bills at Bears? Minus 11. Yay. So I don't care if you're from Buffalo. Minus 11? It's fucking cold. Uh, and then for the Bills' remainder of the season, they've got the Cincinnati Bengals on the road the week after. That is on Monday, January 2nd. Uh, and then they close out the regular season at home against the New England Patriots. It's a tough road. It really is. I don't care what happened with New England this past week. That is going to be a tough road for the Bills to run outright, which they need to do. They understood the gravity of the situation. They needed to beat Miami to mm-hmm. have the number one spot. They're going to have a tough challenge with Chicago. I don't care that Chicago's record is what it is. It's going to be that cold. And if Justin Fields can run on them, he's going to open up a lot of holes for a lot of his no-named offensive players because I couldn't tell you who's on Chicago's offense right now. I really can't. But I know that Fields is going to show up for this one. Yeah, uh, some of the other, uh, just because he tweeted out a couple others here, uh, the other notable feels-like temperature forecasts here. Uh, so you've got Seahawks at Chiefs. The forecast, it feels like, is minus 6. Uh, Saints, mm-hmm. at, Saints at Browns, minus 9. Oh, that's great weather. Uh, Texans at Titans is actually the warmest of the bunch. Or no, sorry, second warmest of the bunch. It's 5 degrees. Uh, Falcons at Ravens, 7. And then the Raiders at the Steelers, minus 4. That, oh. That's going to be a brutal game. The Raiders at Steelers is going to be colder, too, because it's right by the rivers. So. Yeah, exactly. That. I've I've attended a West Point football game. That's the U.S. Military Academy football game, which is at the start of the Hudson River. Fucking freezing Yeah, when the wind's coming off that river. Fucking Pittsburgh's got like three of them right there. Yeah, it's. Oh. I, I knew people that were going to go down to the game in the past because it was going to be this cold. Oh, oh, I don't blame them. Yeah, I don't blame <laughs> them one bit. But this could be a great uh, test for the Bills and for Miami, too. I mean, anything could happen. Yeah. Uh, and then looking at some of the other games we had this season, or the, this season, the, uh, this week, on Thursday, you had the San Francisco 49ers beat the Seattle Seahawks 21-13. to Brock Purdy's the real deal. Goat. I, you know, the funny thing is people are trying to say, if you ever compare his image with uh, Jim Harbaugh, Mm. It's the same. Maybe Jim Harbaugh's a tra- time traveler. That's what we're all saying, and I'm going with that theory right now. Like it's crazy when you put the comparisons up against. So there'll be something for a homework this week. ODPH Society. 
Uh, and then the game I think a lot of people have been waiting us to talk about. Uh, you had the Minnesota Vikings beat the Indianapolis Colts by the final score of 39-6. to Oh, my God. Where do we begin here? Where do we begin? Is there anyone who got as much joy out of this game than me? Probably not. No. This, is, this has been the did pad I, pick of the week. Did I love seeing the Indianapolis Colts blow the largest lead in NFL history? You know, because it was at one point it was thirty three. So if you don't know, uh, it was thirty three to nothing at halftime. Indianapolis put up seventeen points unanswered in the first quarter, and then sixteen points in the second quarter. They came out and uh, in Minnesota scored a touchdown to cut it to thirty three to seven, and then uh, the Colts scored a field goal to put it up to thirty six to seven, and then Indianapolis proceeded to not score for the rest of the game. Yeah, And Minnesota made the now largest comeback in NFL history because the largest up to this point was the Patriots uh, against the Falcons in the Super Bowl. That was 25. Uh, you know, that was 25 points. And now, so now you've got the Vikings with 33 points, twice arguably, mm-hmm. uh, ma- making a comeback. And interesting little tidbit. Uh, they threw up the stat during the game. Uh, up until Sunday, uh, teams leading by 30-plus points. Uh, this is the record since 1930. Teams leading by 30 points uh, were 1,548, 1, and 1. Jesus. So a goddamn near certainty. However, now you've got to amend that to 1,548 and 2. Jeff Saturday needs to go. Oh, my God. If this is his audition, fuck, he's blowing it. He's done. I'm sorry. He's got to go. He had a chance to get this yeah. locked up. He had a he, chance to get the job, and if not this job, maybe some other job. Yeah. But fuck, no. no. He's going back to the commentating booth. I'm sorry. This team will not escape this loss. If I'm Matt Ryan, I call it a season after this. I call it a career. I'll be honest. I feel bad for Matt Ryan. I legit feel bad for him. Because he was great in college. Mm-hmm. You know, Boston College was great at Boston College. Pretty good in the NFL too. I mean, hell, he very won, solid quarterback. He won an MVP award. Yeah, you know, led the Falcons to the Super Bowl. But what's he going to remember? Be remembered for? Not the stats, not the accolades, not the college career. It's the two biggest blown leads in NFL history. Yeah, God, I feel bad for him. It's it's an awful stat that'll oh, haunt that, him. Well, that feeling's over. Yeah, I was going to say. Do I feel bad for him now? Nope. Nope. Pat had to get that out of the way. He's just trying to be polite. But this team, I'm sorry, they're just not good. They're oh. really not good. They should get the number one draft pick if they were in a perfect world, but for some reason they got three more wins than Houston. Yeah, I don't even understand how, to be honest with you. This was a rough one, and there is nothing to be excited about if you're a Colts fan right now. There nope. really isn't. The major rebuilding that is going to happen with this team. you got to rip that thing down to the studs. Yeah. Like, you can... You can I, I just like I say, I'm stuttering to say this because I'm like I would never think I would say this about Indianapolis. Granted, they're the most boring team in football, but they're just the worst team in football. Well, I mean, they had some decent years when Andrew Luck was there, but then Andrew Luck retired, and it's gone off a cliff like Thelma and Luis. Well, when you bank on a franchise quarterback to be there for ten plus years. Because right. that's you know, usually when we take the number hopefully, one pick, hopefully. That's the expectation. Yeah. Unless reasons. Oh yeah. With Andrew Luck retiring as quickly as he did. The Colts have never had a plan B ready, mm-hmm. and I don't care who you're plugging and playing. Carson Wentz wasn't the guy; we all knew that. Well, it's that their plug and play has just been, you know, veterans who are arguably at the back end of their career. Mm-hmm. Philip Rivers. Listen, don't get me wrong; Philip Rivers is great statistically. He ain't the guy. He was never the guy, though. Yeah, you know, Carson Wentz, not the guy. You know, you look at Matt Ryan again, a veteran quarterback on the twilight years of his career, who just ain't it. No, he's not. And this team has nothing really else. Jonathan Taylor had a subpar season, and now teams can really focus in on him moving forward. But I know he's done for the season. I believe he's out on IR. Oh, okay. It, it's not looking great. Like if he's not, if he's not there. I think he's pretty close to being deactivated for the season. Like right. he's, he's in bad shape. Right. Nothing to write home about here for Minnesota, though. This is an this is a bad win. The weirdest team, yeah. This is the weirdest team in football. I'm sorry. Like, it, don't get me wrong. It's great that you set the NFL record for largest comeback in NFL history, but the fact that you're 11 and three, you were down. Da- you're you're 11 and three. You were down at one point, 33 to nothing. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, you are officially taking the beer from the Los Angeles Chargers for the most inconsistent team in football. Oh yeah. Without like, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't think anybody could out. Charger, the Chargers. They're they're making a case. Here they are. I have no faith in this team in the playoffs. None. I don't care if they somehow get the number one seed. 
I still don't have any faith in them going to the Super Bowl. No, I don't either. So, oh, just ugly game top to bottom, unless you have fantasy players involved. Yeah. And, of course, I had Kirk Cousins on the bench because, mm. well, I, I took more notable names. Sure. I took Patrick Mahomes. and sure. I, And then, well, we'll get into my other quarterback when we get down to mm. further games. Uh, you had the Cleveland Browns beat the Baltimore Ravens by the final score of 13-3. to Ugly game, too. Well, not having Lamar Jackson will do that for you. Yep. And the Baltimore, like, this was not Baltimore football. I almost think that they have to take a look at their coaching situation. I mean, you can make the case. I mean, they had the one Super Bowl win, and since then it's been kind of a whole lot of nothing. They've usually been more consistent, and I understand that different things are happening this season, but this is not Baltimore Ravens defense that they're known for, and this is not Baltimore Ravens football. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying you got to really put this in perspective, especially this is not a Harbaugh-led team like that we've seen in the past. Right. Just saying. Uh, you had the Philadelphia Eagles beat the Chicago Bears by the final score of 25-20. to 20. Closer game than I thought it was going to be. Uh, uh, also concerning, uh, Jalen Hurts might be done. Yeah, they are trying to evaluate right now what's going on with him. Yeah, he's currently listed as questionable, uh, and that he uh, he's not was listed as a non-participant on Tuesday's estimated injury report. Uh, the concerning thing is he did, I guess, sustain a shoulder injury during the game against Chicago, but there is some speculation that, depending on the severity, he could be done for the year. Yeah, which is fucking wild, considering the Eagles are thirteen and one. That's the biggest thing that Eagles fans are really going to have to worry about with this one. Uh, I I would hate to see their season end. Oh, like this. I would. Too. I mean, granted, they have a very good backup in Gardner Minshew. Yeah, but the stash, the stash is back, baby. Oh yeah, baby, Uncle Rico. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to my wrestling promo voice, but I just don't see this team getting there with Minshew. No, I'm sorry. No, like there's a lot of good pieces around him, but just the difference level between Minshew and and Hertz is night and day. Yeah. So, something to keep an eye on if you're a Philly fan. Ah, uh, just keep positive energy. That's the only thing you can say uh-huh. right now. Uh, you had the New Orleans Saints beat the Atlanta Falcons 21-18. to Who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? Atlanta took a big L. Yeah, they did. This was a winnable game. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you had the Pittsburgh Steelers beat the Carolina Panthers 24-16. to Honestly surprised at this one. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I thought that this was going to go the other way. I thought Carolina might be able to sneak this out, but the Maserati showed up. Yeah. Super happy to see that. And for Pittsburgh, well, it might throw off a draft pick here, but they're playing for pride. Yeah. So, you know, I can't be mad about this. Uh, you had the Denver Broncos. Let's ride. Beat the Arizona Cardinals 24 to 15. Well, both teams are bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, was, what is it I saw? The Colt McCoy left the game because of an injury, so in came Trace McSorley. Yep. What the fuck? Yeah, this is – when you have tickets and you're debating about going to a game or, you know, what to do with them. Right. This is one you go by default. Like there's sure. There's nothing exciting about this. Like, hey, like, I'm sorry, Denver, not good. Arizona, really not good. Yeah. Injury plagued, top to bottom. So this one uh, kind of went a little surprising. I thought Arizona might be able to sneak something yeah. out, but – Sorry. I mean, on the plus side, hey, if you're a season ticket holder for Arizona, Colt McCoy was listed on the injury report uh, yesterday as we record. Uh, listed as questionable because of the concussion. Uh, and the ho- head coach Cliff Kingsbury said he's day-to-day. Uh, but, however, looking at the injury report for today, not listed. So, yeah. hey, if you're consider going, maybe. Uh, and then we had the – oh, God, we had – well, let's let's leave this one for last. Okay. Uh, you had the L.A. Chargers beat the Tennessee Titans 17-14. to Ugly game. Mm-hmm. I had Justin Herbert as my other quarterback. Hey. Well, like if you look at it on paper, it's Justin Herbert or it's Kirk Cousins. Yeah. Who do you go with? Yeah. So this one knocked me out of my one fantasy team. So uh, definitely. I had Patty Mahomes. Well, I have Mahomes as my other quarterback in the other league. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a split. So I feel good with Patty Mahomes. I don't exactly feel so good with um, – Mr. Herbert. I had 30 from Patty Mahomes, uh, 11 from Jacobs, 23 from Dalvin Cook. Kittle got me 21. Ezekiel Elliott got me 13. I had this shit locked up by like the 4 o'clock games on Sunday. Yeah, that's always the best feeling. But yeah. going to this game, really surprising, I guess, into some certain degree. I mean, Tennessee has not been Tennessee of old. Yeah. And the Chargers, you never know what team is going to show up. So, an ugly game, nevertheless, nothing really to write home about, but the Chargers hang on, and 
I know that some people are super excited that it looks like they might sneak into the playoffs there, yeah, but maybe. But wait and see. Uh, you had the Cincinnati Bengals beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 34-23. to Tom Brady, for the first time in his NFL career, losing eight games. I'm telling you right now. And I'm not saying that as a bitter Patriots fan. That's just a statistic. Brady's got to go. You, you it, can make that argument. It's done. I'm so, No, it's done. I'm sorry. This is the Peyton Manning farewell tour. I understand he came back. I understand that he might get into the playoffs. This team is not going anywhere. No, they're not. They are bad. They are very, very bad. Cincinnati, though, on the flip side, have a day, Joe yeah. Burrow. Four touchdowns really is leading this team back to where they should have been all season. They're now in that driver's seat to get into the playoffs, and they're going to make some noise when they get in there. Barring any injuries, this team is clicking on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. They're going to be a, a force to reckon with in the playoffs. And, you know, if, if they got to go play in Buffalo, too, they're not afraid to go in that snow. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a hell of a game if that's the matchup. But Cincinnati's clicking. Uh, and you had the Monday night game where the Green Bay Packers beat the L.A. Rams by the final score of 24-12. to 12. Uh, This loss for the Rams knocked them out of the playoff contention. They are eliminated, thus extending the record of 18 seasons since the team has repeat as Super Bowl champions. Remind me who that team was again. I need Listen, I need something good for this team right now. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the Patriots. Yeah. They're the, they're the last NFL team to repeat. Yeah, this is one of those situations where... The Rams were beat up all season. It was just a case of bad luck. Yeah, it's, you know, let them rest finally. Yeah. You know, like give give your starters who have been playing hurt all year and get them healthy for next year. Like, no, just call it a wash. Solid win for the Packers. I mean, I don't know exactly what's going to happen with them. They could make some playoff magic happen if the right ball f falls in their way, but at least they're not doing as bad as Dallas these days. Yeah, that's true. Because we, we, I know we, we glared over that because Jacksonville had a day Forty to thirty-four yeah. over Dallas in yeah. overtime. If Cowboys fans, how you feeling? How you feeling right now? Mm. I know. I know. We'll have one tweeting at us the minute here is this episode. We, we clinched a playoff spot. Yeah, but you're still lost. Yeah, this <laughs> in, in overtime. This is a scary loss. This is a very very scary loss. Jacksonville is yeah. not really that good, but you made them look like they are Super Bowl contenders. I'm I mean, sorry. This is bad. I mean, listen, if, if Saquon Barkley ain't going to get comeback player of the year award, at least Trevor Lawrence should. Yeah, he should be in contention. He, he should, given how fucking bad he was the first year and how good he is this year, he well, could get a consideration. Well, you know what? He has stability of coaching. And that and, that helps. And also, Travis Attain is still there, too. So he has some players to work with. So it does help their cause moving forward. But for Dallas, it's also a situation that this game, you were up big early, uh -huh. and you let them come back. Yeah, and this and for that defense, I I understand it's injury plague, but uh, still something to worry about. And before I turn it back over to you, I know the stat everybody's worried about: Christian Kirk, six catches, ninety-two uh, yards, ninety million dollars, folks. Uh, also, should be no up note because I saw this come across my phone uh, uh, this afternoon from Bleach Report. Uh, listen, for good win, Jags were they all were also eating pretty well after the game because uh, according to John Shipley of Jaguars Report, uh, who spoke with Jacksonville-based Philly's finest uh, restaurant owner Jeff Harris, uh, he sent thirty-five cheesesteaks and twenty-five large fries over to Coach Doug Peterson and his staff. So those Jaguars are eating pretty good. Amazing. Love hearing that. Yep. Love hearing that. And then we, we we have to be honest. There's another game I know Pat doesn't want to talk about. Uh huh. But we have to talk about it. The saving grace about this game is it wasn't on locally because I would have legit fucking thrown something. I don't blame you because this was one of the most boneheaded plays I think I've seen in quite some time. Oh, it is. It's worse than the Miami one. Yeah. It's worse than putting Gronk in deep coverage on a fucking Hail Mary pass. Those Las Vegas Raiders. Yep. Took one away from New England. After they made a comeback. After a comeback was made because for some reason we are playing to win the game and we don't have a way to just say we're going to go to overtime. No, no, no. We're going to just try playing the lateral of all laterals. Fucking Cal Stanford. Yes. And boy, did that ever backfire. Chandler Jones picks it off. For a Patriot. Yep. Gives an ultimate stiff arm to Mac Jones and runs it back into the end zone yep. to get the W for the Raiders, who are now in contention for those playoffs. Mm-hmm. Pad? What the fuck are they thinking? 
You blow a, a tremendous game from Ramondre Stevenson. 19 carries, mm-hmm. 172 yards, one touchdown. His longest was 34. The man was averaging 9.1 yards per carry. Yeah. It's a goddamn first down a carry. I'm sorry, it's second and one. It's a fucking first down. When you've got Nick Folk as your kicker, who, let's face it, he's not Adam Vinatieri, he's not Justin Tucker, but he's pretty goddamn good. Mm-hmm. At one point, he I don't know what the exact stat is, but he had a, some streak going of field goals made or extra points made or whatever the fuck it was of, like, 50 attempts or some shit. So he's pretty as goddamn automatic as it comes. In this game, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a dome stadium, right? Mm-hmm. With the ability to open the roof as, yeah. as needed, but still, indoors. Why the fuck are you throwing laterals and all this bullshit? New England has never been known as a special teams prodigy team. Yeah. They've they if they're lucky, they get one punt return a year and maybe one kickoff return a year, and that's it. They are not listen, I know they've got one of the greatest special teams players of all time, and fight me on that one in Matthew Slater. Mm-hmm. Man's been to ten Pro Bowls on, yeah. on special teams alone. He, he's a Steve Tasker t- bro- prototype. Exactly. You mm-hmm. know, but outside of that, they've never been known for special teams. Mm-hmm. Why the fuck are you throwing laterals? Take go down. Let yeah. your offense try to kick it. Get the points. Let Mac try and get it. You've got Ramondre. This is like fucking Marshawn Lynch not getting the handoff in the Super Bowl. Yep. You've got Ramondre, who is about as goddamn automatic in this game as it comes. You know, and, and listen, I realize Jacoby Myers fucked up. I'm not putting this on him. And I realize the refs blew that call with the touchdown late in the game. Yeah, that was another big one. Blatantly. And, and they I th- they almost did admit it. They, they didn't fully admit it. Uh, one of the Patriots reporters for ESPN was the pool reporter picked to speak with the uh, refs after the game. And they, they said they didn't have the one angle to see whatever. But that catch was out of bounds. But, hey, listen, that's neither here nor there. You know, the Raiders still won the game. But when it comes to the laterals, what the fuck are you do- to qu- Quote Julian Edelman. What the fuck are we doing? Mm-hmm. Why are you throwing laterals when you've got Ramondre, who's about as automatic as they come, a pretty goddamn decent receiving core who admittedly wasn't having the greatest game. Your leading receiver was Jacoby Myers of 47 yards. Yeah. But it's still, you've got John o. Smith and Hunter Henry, who are pretty goddamn good tight ends. And you've got Nick Folk, who's about as automatic as they fucking come. And plus, you've got... You've got Matthew Judon and Josh Uche, who are at least in double digits in terms of sacks. Mm -hmm. Give it to your offense to try and get Folk in range for fucking a field goal, and then just blitz Uche and Judon the entire time the uh, the Raiders are going down the field. Yeah. Why the what the fuck? I have no words for this, Pat. To be honest with you, I saw this and I went literally, "Are you kidding me?" Yeah, because I, like I said, wasn't able to watch the game because I was hanging out with my girlfriend, Liz, Mm because it's her birthday this week. And we were stopping by at one of her friend's house. It was one of her friend's kid's birthdays, and we were dropping off a gift. You know, so I was listening to the game on the radio, on the drive over there for Sirius. And I'm listening, and they they tie the game up. The Raiders tie the game up. I'm like, what the fuck? All right, pissed off, whatever. And then I'm standing in there talking with Liz and and our friends and, and their kids and whatever. And I just get the notification that the Raiders won. And I went. The f- what happened? Like, I'm in front, front of kids. I'm, you know, yeah. kids are like six years old, uh, at least two years old, and one's a newborn. So I'm not trying to drop any f bombs in front of kids here. I'm like, what the heck happened? Like what? And so then I start getting messages. I'm like, I'm like, are you kidding me? And I told them what happened. I'm like, it's a th- lucky thing I wasn't in front of a TV for this because I would have broken the TV. I don't blame you. This was as puzzling as you get. Why they tried laterally instead of going down? Like okay, lateraling. Sorry. When you are trying to extend the play for reasons, yeah. like, as, like yeah. I said, there, there's no... It never works well unless the fucking band is out on the field. Exactly. There was no point to it. It was none. Name, name me the last... Somebody, hashtag ODPH pod. Name me the last time there was one of these schoolyard bullshit plays where they're lateral, 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 you know, and I'm, and I'm not talking the Music City Miracle because that was like one lateral. And yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they yeah, just yeah. went down the field, but I'm talking... An illegal one, yes. Multiple laterals where it ended up winning them the game. It never fucking works. Uh, I, no, I'm trying to think if there was a couple of years ago in college that this happened. And sure, I, but, college. But it's college, not in the pros, though. Absolutely atrocious. That's the easiest way you can describe it. Like, this game should have been all the Patriots, but the Raiders have found a way to win. 
big, big momentum shift, and this really, in my opinion, really hurts the playoffs chances for the Patriots. Oh, yeah. No, they're not going to make it now. I'll guarantee you goddamn to you that. No, that loss is crucial. Matt Patricia's got to fucking go. Yeah, he's got to go. Joe Judge has got to fucking go. And you got to get somebody who's a goddamn actual offensive coordinator in there. Yeah. The, I'm not saying Belichick's got to go. That's that's. I'm not there yet. But you got to. I'm none of this. Well, I don't believe in, in terms bullshit. Yeah. Get a fucking offensive coordinator in there. You know, they should get us Tom Brady next season. Yeah, maybe. Bring him back. Right the ship. It's a long one, folks. This week of the NFL action definitely had a lot of storylines going on with that, and we definitely want to keep that conversation going with you. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What is your takeaways from this week in the NFL? There's a lot of storylines going into those playoffs and only a few games left. How's your team shaping up? Let's have that conversation. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You know what that sound means? It's another episode of Game for a Movie, where we ask, are you game for a movie? Tell me, Andre. There's no special features on that goddamn DVD. All right? Oh, wow. For Hansel and, Hansel and Gretel? Hansel and Gretel. You have the watch, DVD. You watch it? Yeah. Oh, Hansel Hansel and Gretel. Gretel. She basically has sex with it, somehow. Uh, it, foreplay. Yeah. Yes. She's, she's chair foreplay. Yeah, I mean, they knocked out of the park, which is why it's my number three. So. Oh! oh. <laughs> yes. I mean, I wouldn't be in it, because this movie doesn't have women. But, you know, that's you why I was right. It has one. You, you would have that. three lines of dialogue. So but how much? Oh. Okay. So I'm actually going to get, like, I actually get, like, I earn my, my, my four sentences of dialogue rather than, like, here, I'm a paycheck. You just stood there on the screen. You're a sexy lamp. Oh. Anyway, we're Phoenix, too. Uh, so, no. So no. <laughs> no. 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 Because they really hate each other, so we get to enjoy some wonderful comedic scenes of them hating each other so much that they get into physical altercations that include her biting detective ex-detective phillips's dick okay but we don't okay in the hot tub. i i know all of those words were english but the way you <laughs> constructed yeah, them i'm I, lost I'm not, I'm not finding the racism very well for those who haven't rated us or uh, liked or given us a review, don't say that we haven't given you anything of value after listening to this podcast. You now know the difference between an R-rated dick and an NC-17 X-rated dick. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening to Game for a Movie, where we ask, are you game for a movie? We'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, and it's time to talk a little bit pro wrestling. Yes, it is. And this week has been an interesting one, oh, yeah. to say the least, for yeah. the WWE. Mm-hmm. Obviously, going into the holiday season, they are planning on having a big 2023, but I don't think that they were expecting a little bit of controversy on the way out of 2022. Yeah, because usually you get to this time of year, it's a little quiet, you mm-hmm. know, not too much going on, nothing crazy, but uh, yeah, it's been a little crazy for them this week. To say the least, because rarely have you seen a wrestler get released right after defending a title. Mm -hmm. And a lot of drama has come out about this, so we've been kind of digging through the facts a little bit, trying to figure out what has been going on. Obviously, if you listen to 607 TWS, the wrestling show, we talked about this a little bit last night. And we're just kind of following up about this because Pat's got some takes on this as well. And, Pat, what are we going to be talking about? Yeah, so we're talking about, obviously, the Mandy Rose situation. Mandy Rose, who was the 400-plus day, whatever it was, uh, reigning uh, NXT Women's Championship, you know, debuted in WWE uh, on the main roster, you know, went back down to NXT, kind of reinvented herself, you know, came up with a new version of the character. Because it still felt like the same character, just a little different, a little more edge to it. Mm -hmm. You know, very successful run, one of the better runs down in NXT. And so the, you flash back to the deadline uh, pay-per-view premium live event they had the previous weekend uh, where uh, Roxanne Perez won the Iron Survivor Women's Challenge, you know, whatever the name is, to become the new number one contender for the NXT Women's Championship. And it was already said that it wasn't, wasn't going to be until like January or February where the matchup was going to take place. Mm-hmm. Well, then you had an angle written on or come in on Tuesday this past week where, you know, she was like, hey, I'm not going to I don't want to wait. Let's do the matchup tonight. Yeah. And and Mandy says, OK, you're on. So the main event of NXT this past week was Roxanne Perez versus Mandy Rose for the NXT Women's Championship. And you had uh, Roxanne Perez emerge victorious, pinning Mandy Rose to become your and new NXT Women's Championship. And everyone went, well, that was sudden. I wonder what's going on with this. 
didn't have to wait long uh, because as we found out the next day, or maybe it was that night, I forget which, uh, Mandy Rose was released from her contract at World Wrestling Entertainment. Yeah, very su- shocking and surprising. And as the story is unfolding, it was allegedly due to her having a subscription-based service that did yeah. not fall into the parameters of her WWE contract. Yeah, so obviously the speculation started hard and heavy once it was going on, and then stuff started to trickle out about as to what it is. And like I mentioned, it was a subscription service not only fans but in the same kind of in the vein of only fans yeah it's 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 called fan time yeah fan and, time where and, you pay a subscription to get basically you pay a subscription to get in the door but then you sometimes have to pony up more money to see other things posted there uh and she and clearly wwe had no issue with her doing kind of the scantily clad uh, aspect of things. I mean, you think back to the World's Collide event where she won the women's UK belt and she retained the NXT women's belt and she did the f- post or the pose poolside with one belt up top and one belt, you know, down south. Uh, Sean Michaels. Sean Michaels, you know, so they clearly had no issue with that because that photo was up and remains up, you know. So people started wondering, well, well why would they fire her over this and why was this going on? And then some of the photos started coming out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of the photos that were leaked out on the internet uh, allegedly were very, very racy and very uh, not... Pushing the boundaries. Yeah, exactly. It was pushing a lot of boundaries that the WWE was not exactly very cool with. Yeah. So, and reading based off an article that is on the New York Post, okay, they kind of did give some clarification to this. So, this is quoting the article, like I said, from the New York Post. Quote, WWE has made it clear to its performers that using their names and likenesses through third-party platforms must go through them. Failure to do so in, will result in, dis- in discipline from the company or termination. Mm. Much like Disney and Warner Brothers, WWE creates, promotes, and invests uh, intellectual properties, i.e. the stage names of their performers like The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, Roman Reigns, Big E, and Braun Strowman, the company said in a 2020 statement. So this is kind of t- t- touching back that they've had a clarity for this okay. already going. So this okay. is, like I said, this is based off a New York Post report that uh, came out by Jenna Lemonosi. So uh, I hope I pronounced the name right. Yeah, and no, so that, that's kind of like the, the gist of things, where things stand. I mean, if you've seen the photos, I I listen. Me personally, I understand why they did it, and mm-hmm. I have and I have no issue with it. You know, listen. You know, she wanted to pursue that avenue of you know the site and the and it's not OnlyFans. I'll call it OnlyFans, but the OnlyFans aspect of things. And hey, listen, if that works for you, fine, G- good for you. Do you, boo boo? You know, I got no issues with it. You know, but where, you know, I don't have issue with WWE doing it is because you sign a contract. There's a lot of legalese in there. And there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of do's and don'ts in that contract. And it's very well known that they don't want their talent using their names for stuff they might make money on. That's the reason Dakota Kai doesn't use her name on her Twitch channel. Mm-hmm. That's the reason when Adam Cole Baby. was with WWE at NXT. He started his Twitch channel. It's not Adam Cole. It's the Chugs. Yes. You know, that's, you know, the reason Cesaro had one. He doesn't, he didn't, well, Claudio now, but when Cesaro and all them were doing the party and doing their Uno live streams, he wasn't Cesaro on Twitch. He was, you know, something else. You know, it's very well established in, in all this. And, and I think. I think she she was playing with fire to a certain degree because mm-hmm. clearly, as I said, they had no issue with her doing the scantily clad, you know, the risque stuff, you know, like I said, with the two the two title belts. But given some of the photos that have come out, she had to have known she was pushing that boundary. Yeah, because in one video that's come out, she did a Q&A topless in a pool and you could certainly see some aspects of things. Uh, and there's also one photo with her and her now fiance, I believe. At, yep. the, at the time, they might have been boyfriend and girlfriend, but now they're they're engaged to be married. Where there's certainly some uh, conclusions you can draw from said photo, what's going on? Yeah, you know. So I th- and, and when this is WWE and they've got a multi million, if not multi billion, dollar deal with Mattel for the toys, mm-hmm. and and you're marketing these to kids, you know, and and little girls, especially in the case of Mandy Rose and and the other female superstars. You don't want to market a, a, a superstar or person when they can go on the internet and go, oh, hey, I want to look up the Mandy Rose highlights. And given the recency of this, that could very, could very well turn up. Yeah. Now, I realize there are some folks going, well, what about Seth Rollins? And what about Paige? And what about X, you know, X, Y, and Z? 
all fruit, but different at the same time. You know, the, the difference between, let's just say, Seth Rollins and Mandy Rose. Seth didn't intend for that to be seen by the public. Mm-hmm. That was meant to be shared between two individuals, himself and the party he was sending it to. You know, obviously there were other set of circumstances which led to that being released. Same can be said for Paige. Paige never meant for that to be seen by the light of day yeah. outside of those involved. Mandy did. Now, admittedly, it's not a whole lot of people were meant to see this because it's behind a paywall. But still, Mandy intended for this to be seen. She wanted this to be seen. Did she want it to get leaked? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not Mandy Rose. I'm not going to sit here and speculate and put thoughts in her head or intentions behind her actions. But I, I think she knew to a certain degree what she was getting into. And I knew she and I think she knew she was playing with fire. I think any time that you deal with a corporation such as WWE, there is always factors in the contracts you sign that have parameters about situations like this because the subscription-based service is a growing business. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot that goes into what you can and cannot do. And I think for the WWE... They've gone away from the Attitude Era where you had a lot of former divas Mm -hmm. posing for Playboy. They're they're cleaned up their image to more of a family-friendly because they're doing a lot more business with family-oriented businesses such as Mattel. And they also have a very big broadcasting deal that is going to be up in the air. Oh, yeah. And that is probably going to be one of the biggest television deals of all time. Close to maybe the, uh, uh, what is it, the NFL Sunday ticket. Yeah. They definitely don't want to have anything like that that would possibly ruin the business aspects of it. Yeah. And for what Mandy did, I'm sure they kept an eye on things, as they do with all their talent, and they have somebody monitoring, because that's what they do when you're that big of a business. They have people that are keeping track. And I'm sure if something came through, like I would have to say I speculate, because I don't know anything specific. Sure, sure. But I speculate that they probably said, hey, something was going on. And I'm sure if you go through the back history of her account, they probably, if there was a time that there was ever a pause, they probably were given her a warning about this. Yeah, there could be. And then if she was still progressing forward, that is her choice to do. I don't have any problem with anything that she does or no. anybody that has an OnlyFans. More power to you. If that's your choice you want to do, by all means do that. If you're doing that as a side hustle or you're doing that as a main business, that is your business. But if you're working for somebody like the WWE, yeah. you can't go and do this without the consent. And if they say no, then you can't go push it forward if you still want to remain employed there. Right. That is the big takeaway from this. The Seth Rollins and the Page things is disgusting. To bring, well, the Page one especially, especially is, is, yeah. is disgusting to bring back she, up. She contemplated suicide because of what people were saying and doing because of that. Yeah. That was never meant to see the light of day. No. That is a whole different ball of wax. What Mandy is doing is she was doing something for her business that was supposed to only go to subscribers of said business. Mm-hmm. This was not meant for the general public. The Seth and the Page things were phone hacks or deliberately done maliciously. Yep. That is not for no monetary gain. The fact that people are bringing up, go fuck yourselves. Like, seriously, I, I agree with what Rich was saying on 607 TWS about that. Yeah. So taking that away from the equation, Mandy is released... Yeah. Allegedly, uh, according to the article that I said uh, from the New York Post, which uh, was written by Jenna Lemoncelli, so I do apologize for the name, uh, screw up earlier, quote, Rose, who was fired by the WWE after posting racy photos to her fan time page, has since earned $500,000 from the subscription-based platform her agent Malik Kawa told TMZ. Well, that's not a surprise. Right. So Mandy is doing quite all right if this is the option she wants to go with moving forward. And this is kind of the situation WWE is making a very big statement about is they want to progress with their business. They're a publicly traded firm. They're not they're in a bigger platform and spotlight than AEW or any right. other pro wrestling federation. Because right. I know other people are saying, Well, AEW doesn't care. They're not no. on the same level. Yeah, no, they're not. They do care, but it's a it's a different level. It's a different playing field. Yeah. No matter what you want to try saying. There are more business dealings involving WWE than there is AEW. Yep. All the sponsorship deals and what have you. Yeah, there's a whole lot more that goes in with the WWE daily business with a publicly traded company on the Wall Street Stock Exchange than whatever is going on with AEW. I'll say the WWE has to worry about, you know, the Mattel deals and the 2K deals and the, 
you know, whatever other deals I got with with companies that make their stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and then they've got the sponsorships to worry about and the ticket sales and the merch sales and, and all this, but they also have stockholders and shareholders to, yeah. to worry about. Whereas AEW, they only really got, you know, Tony Khan and, and the powers that be at, at w, Warner Brothers Discovery to worry about. They, yeah. they don't have, you know, folks investing their own money in through the stock exchange into this company. Yeah. So you, it's a whole different ball of wax yeah, there. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I side with WWE about this. I, I understand. Do too. Like I said, I, I have no problem with Mandy does. I don't have a problem with anybody that has an OnlyFans or does a service like this. Because I know there's the world's. That you see a lot of the yep. former WWE uh, talent. They have a bunch of them. Right. That's fine. Like, listen, do you and make money off it, and I hope you're very successful at it. I truly do. But in this situation, WWE was in the right for making the call that they did. Yeah. This is something that for being a company at the stature they are, they have to handle very quickly and swiftly. They did. If Mandy's heart is into wrestling, I, she's going to have to make a decision if she wants to come back. And this is, son tells me she's going to see the dollar signs and she's going to be like, you know what? I'm good. Yeah. Well, do you mean I, you cause, can't, uh, cause honestly to anyone who thinks she's upset about leaving this, please, this is for, this is probably the best thing that could have happened to her because she's probably making more for this than she did while wrestling. It's arguably. Yeah. Like, and, I and say, it's a lot less stressful on the body. Oh yeah. So uh, like I say, it depends on what she wants to do as far as pro wrestling is concerned. But for right now, she's making plenty, according to her agent there, that she will be able to live very, very comfortably. Oh, yeah. So more power to her moving forward. And if we see her come back in a wrestling ring, chances are it probably won't be WWE for a while. It's not going to be for a while, yeah. For a very for a very long time, if she wants to keep as long as she has that site up. If she, does, if she wants to keep the site and still do wrestling, I'm sure that you might see her pop up on an AEW here and there. Probably. Maybe. Maybe more or less impact, because I think that that would be the landing spot, but... Listen, more power to her, whatever she wants to do. But in this situation, we side with the WWE. But it wasn't all bad news or controversy with the WWE this no. week. Monday Night Raw definitely was generating a lot of headlines Ooh-hoo. going into the uh, holiday week, so to speak. Yep. Yep. So, Pat, what stood out to you for this past Monday? Yeah, so this was uh, the last Monday Night Raw before the holidays because as they announced uh, in their last Monday Night Raw of the year uh, because uh, they announced next week is going to be a best of show. There won't be any live show. And then the week after we get the new year. Uh, so this was the last live Monday Night Raw for the year. And it was, you got to admit, pretty goddamn good show to close out the year. And I think maybe they knew that going to be the last one of the year. Let's make it good. Uh, because they opened up with Paul Heyman uh, introducing the one, the only, the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. Basically came and said, hey, listen, Kevin Owens, you're, bet you're showing up to my show all the time and trying to get on the island of relevancy. I'm coming to you. And it's going to take more than just the raw, raw locker room to stop to stop me from finding you. So then there were segments and vignettes throughout the night of, what was it, the Usos, Jimmy and Jay, Sammy and Solo Sokoa backstage beating the holy hell out of basically everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Mustafa Ali got beat up. Uh, Elias got beat up. He got his guitar shattered over his back. Andre Chase. Chase, you! Uh, from NXT got beat up. He was backstage apparently from some main event tapings. Uh, Dolph Ziggler and Cedric Alexander got beaten up. Uh, but in terms of in the ring, you had uh, Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford of the Street Profits teaming up with Akira Tozawa to take on the Judgment Day in Damian Priest, Dominic Mysterio, and Finn Balor. Uh, you had the uh, Street Profits and Tozawa emerge victorious, uh, winning in 8 minutes and 58 seconds. Not the story of this whole little segment, though. After the match was over, uh, and you got the Street Profits and Tozawa going back up the ring, uh, Rhea Ripley hops uh, out of the ring uh, and marches over to uh, Akira Tozawa for attacking Dominic Mysterio during the match and says, hey, the fuck you think you're doing? And punches him in the face. She's like, "You well, you want to fight? Pick a fight with me. Get in the ring. We're going to have a match. And everyone's like, the fuck? We actually, is this actually going to happen? Goes to commercial, comes back out of commercial break. She's in the ring. There's a ref in the ring. He comes down and gets in the ring. Bell rings. And, folks, we had an intergender matchup in WWE between Rhea Ripley and Akira Tozawa. Mm. And Akira and Rhea Ripley emerged victorious, pinning Akira Tozawa in 4 minutes and 46 seconds. Very interesting to see this happen because WWE, yeah. for much of the same reasons we, we said with Mandy Rose, there are certain guidelines that they don't usually cross. Intergender wrestling. Yeah, they don't usually do. The only the only thing that's even come close is they did the mixed match challenge 
on Facebook a couple of years ago, but even that wasn't male versus female. It was pretty much, you know, there were male participants, male and female t- 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 teammates. What was it? Oscar and the Miz were one. Yeah. You know, but once well, there was a tag or somebody else got in the ring, they had to switch up no matter what was going on. Right. So you haven't really seen this since Jeff Jarrett and China, At if I'm least. not mistaken. Uh, and that was years ago. At least, yeah. So this was kind of very surprising to see. I mean, yeah. I never have a problem with intergender wrestling. I don't either. I mean, I've seen enough of it on the indies. GCW does it extremely well. Right. So it doesn't bother me. Um, I'm curious to see if this can be anything moving forward. or Shelton Benjamin versus Mia Yim when? Oh, I know. A lot of people are asking for that match. That's a WrestleMania match. That could definitely happen, but it's it's a very interesting situation to see if this is going to be something moving forward or they just want to test the waters and see. Because at the end of the day, the advertisers and the powers that be that are investing yeah. in the company are going to have the final say yeah. about if this is going to be a thing. Because if they start having people threaten the poll, sponsorship deals right they're going to step away from this. right well and i know i speculated to you and rich off air if this would happen and i was surprised it happened i was even more surprised this was in the first hour this wasn't after 10 o'clock yeah. or something where it might be a little safer to do the kids might not be awake no they did this literally within like the first half hour of the show uh another matchup you had take place was the oc and carl anderson and luke gallows take on alpha academy uh with uh chad gable and otis uh oc emerged victorious again not the story though because once the matchup was over uh you had the oc with uh, along with aj styles and then also mia yim in the ring kind of celebrating raising their arms like, hey we won uh out comes the bloodline which i know this is a matchup and, and thing fans have wanted for a little while oc versus bloodline uh the bloodline mia yim got out of the ring uh Bloodline started beating the holy hell out of everybody. Adam Pierce and, and some of the officials, quote unquote, came out, you know, hey, get out of here. Hey, get out of here. And while they were going, apparently AJ had snuck off at some point because I did not see him sneak off from this. But once they were going back up the entrance ramp and they were getting ready to leave, AJ came out from the side, basically it looked like for maybe the audience, and left, oh, tried to leap over the officials and attack Sammy. Uh, so that's set up for a matchup later in the night between Sammy Zayn and AJ Styles. But OC versus Bloodline getting teased, maybe? It's a smart move. Yeah. Because I think they're going to need a feud in between the Sami Zayn dissolvement mm-hmm. from the Bloodline. They're going to need something. The OC makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The one factor, though, that I think that is very, very interesting, and I think that this is going to be one that flies under a lot of radars. Sure. Mia Yim is now a member of the OC. Yes. And she was wearing the uh, shirt and um, the colors for the The matching gear. Yeah, so matching gear. So that said, the Bloodline does not have a female member. Right. We have not seen one Naomi Mm -hmm. in quite some time because she walked out with Sasha Banks. Yes. Sasha's situation is almost a different rumor every day. Yeah. But Naomi has been relatively off the radar for quite some time. The only thing I think she's done, and it's not even a pro wrestling, she was at a sporting event, like a basketball game or something. And she was spotted with, I think it was Jade Cargo? Somebody, yes. somebody from AEW. Yeah, it was Jade. They were they were courtside. But past that, we, you know, we haven't really seen or heard much from her. Right. So that said, I'm not doubting that this is how Naomi returns to the WWE. Could be. It's been rumored and fans have speculated for probably a year now about Naomi joining the bloodline. Yeah, it would make perfect sense. I think they should definitely run with it. There's an instant storyline you can plug her in right now, Mm -hmm. and you can definitely have some fun matches going into Mania season. Because, I mean, obviously they're not going to have the OC versus bloodline for Mania. Right. That'll be done beforehand. The closest my, you might see is an Elimination Chamber. Yeah, maybe. That might be the latest you see it running through. But in the meantime, this makes a perfect sense to do. If you want to do it at the Rumble and have a bigger impact when Naomi comes back, I think it's a great move. She's awesome in the ring, and mm-hmm. I think this, this would be a huge, huge way to come back. Because, like I say, we expect her to return when Sasha does, but I don't think WWE is going to do that. I, right. think, I think now it's a separate case. Because Sasha's is ever evolving, and like yeah. I said, I don't want to get into that. Yeah, it's a ball of wax. Yeah, it's it's just it's a very messy rumor express every single day with mm-hmm. that. So. Next up, though. Next up was a ladder match between Dexter Loomis and The Miz. This, of course, was Dexter Loomis's money and Miz's money. Uh, you know, basically money on a on a pole match, almost essentially. Yeah. Uh, where the winner got the money back. You know, it was almost double or nothing. 
You could, you could say. Yeah. Uh, but you had uh, The Miz emerge victorious, pinning Dexter Loomis in 18 minutes and 31 seconds, although with a little bit of help from the returning Bronson Reed. Yeah, this was surprising. Well, to a degree. I didn't have Bronson Reed coming back. Obviously, he's been in New Japan Pro Wrestling doing some things. Right. He's been working the indies. I know when he was released, he was very, very upset. And yep. I mean, rightfully so. I mean, yeah. you, you take your craft very passionately and you get let go. This is a situation that he definitely had a, every right to feel a certain yep. way about. But it was great seeing him come back, and this is another one that Triple H was very, very high on when he was in NXT. Now, coming back with The Miz, he has a good storyline to go right into. He kind of fills in that role with Ciampa, whatever's going on there, because I know he's Ciampa still... Some sort of surgery, I think. Yeah, he's dealing with the... He's going to be out for some time, yeah. so yeah. This, this makes a perfect plug-and-play. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how this, this works out, but uh, especially for somebody who most notably pinned Okada... Yeah. Which I, I for completely forgot until I heard the uh, Uncle Dave. Yeah, yeah, Uncle Dave brought up, you know, he pinned Okada. And the other thing from Uncle Dave, too, because some folks were wondering, well, wait, wasn't he signed with New Japan? According to uh, Uncle Dave Meltzer, uh, he was on a per night or per appearance uh, deal with New Japan, so he wasn't under contract. Yeah, see, that I can't remember. I didn't. I don't know if he did sign a long-term deal. Like, I, he's been kind of off and on. Apparently not, because he's in WWE. Now. Yeah, no, it's, it's and you know what? That's smart on his aspect. Yeah. Because if Bronson felt that he had a chance to come back, obviously when the Vince drama was going down, I think a lot of people that got released right. were keeping their options open right. to return. Because I think right. with Triple H coming back, there was going to be a wide speculation yeah. about who could come back and who can't. Yep. So Bronson Reed will do some big things when he's back at the roster. Yeah. Very interested to see, but you know, him versus Dexter Loomis on a on an early feud is not a bad thing. And Loomis, while this was a loss, it wasn't a bad loss because there was one point where the Miz took him out, put him through the table, you know, and then started burying him alive in like every ladder and chair and anything he could get a hold of. You know, you know that old spot. They, yeah. They bury him and they tr- usually they win because the person can't doesn't usually get back up from that. Loomis got up. They they built they made Loomis look like a monster. See, Loomis is such a tricky character. I don't know what long term right. what they're going to be able to do, but like say you can plug him in certain areas, sure, and he'll make something happen there. I am interested to see what he does moving forward, because mm-hmm. like I said, his character is so weird, yeah, that it's it's going to be a challenge to pull off and really keep fresh, yeah. Uh, next up, you had the matchup that was uh, set up earlier in the night with between Sami Zayn and AJ Styles, with Sami Zayn emerging victorious, although with a little help, because, duh. Uh, pinning AJ Styles in 12 minutes and 34 seconds. Uh, the aforementioned help I mentioned was from one Solo Sokoa, who entered through the audience, caused a little bit of a distraction, helped uh, Sami pick up the win. Good matchup, though. Yeah, very good matchup. Had no issues with this at yeah. all. Uh, and then in the co-main event, you had Bailey taking on Becky Lynch, where you had Bailey pin Becky in 14 minutes and 36 seconds. The thing I got out of this, it was a good matchup between the two. Um, honestly, really good matchup. But the the promo backstage Becky had was very good. Basically, like, hey, let's cut the chat, let's cut the BS. You, me, let's let's not get anything else involved. But obviously, uh, the damage control did get involved. Uh, they were thrown out at ringside though at one point, so that was that was fun to watch. But good matchup between the two. Solid match. I mean, you knew what to expect out of those two. Yeah. Uh, and then in the main event, obviously because this show did take place from Des Moines, Iowa, where they debuted a new Seth Rollins shirt. Which gotta say that shirt really fucking nice. And Seth Rollins coming through the cornfield, saying with the fr- uh, wording on the shirt saying Iowa's own. It's a pretty goddamn good shirt. Check it out. That's cool. Uh, you did have Seth Rollins come out because hey, it is his hometown, looking like Hugh Hefner. Look, if you don't believe me, folks, try and find a photo from last night. Tell me I'm wrong. It was a bright red velvet looking bathrobe looking thing. Mm-hmm. Fucking screamed Hugh Hefner. Uh, but he came out was like, hey, Iowa, cutting the hometown thing. Theory interrupted him because, of course, he did. Reasons. Like, hell of a promo between the two about talking about the mountaintop and how Seth's fallen off. of it. He goes, yeah, I have been to the mountaintop. I have seen all there is to see. But here's the thing. I am the mountaintop. You highly recommend you check out the promo between the two. But in the midst of all of this, we thought the bloodline had left for the night. No, 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 no. In come the bloodline to attack because Seth Seth kind of brought it on himself. He mentioned at the start of his little promo where he was in the ring by himself. Oh, saw the raw locker room getting beat up all night, but they missed me. <laughs> well, in comes the bloodline to kick his ass. He kind of goes, oh, oh, hey, hey, theory. Let's put that aside for a minute. Let's deal with this. 
You know, so they're they're in the ring. Seth takes off the robe. He's getting ready to fight. Theory looks like he's getting ready to take off the jacket he's wearing. He's wearing like a suit jacket or something. He's looking like oh, they're ready to put aside their differences and fight. But if you've watched wrestling for any amount of time, you could see this coming from a mile off. Yeah. Uh, Theory put the jacket back on, walked out on Rollins. Rollins puts up a valiant fight for a little bit, you know, about 30 seconds or so, uh, fighting off Jimmy and Jey Uso. Out comes uh, Kevin Owens over for the save. And then and Pierce is trying to get the bloodline out of there. He goes, and uh, Seth goes, hey, Kevin, you think of what I'm thinking? And Kevin goes, yeah, I think I am. Seth Rollins and Kevin Owens versus the Usos tag match. So that's set up for the main event. There was a little bit of back and forth between the two of them uh, backstage before the matchup, though. Bringing up, hey, we were, we were, and I recommend you check out the, the clip where they're like, hey, we were a really good tag team before. You know, why did we break up? And Kevin goes, are you kidding? It's, it's because you attacked me and tried to take my matchup, and take my spot at WrestleMania. Seth goes, oh, that wasn't me. And, and Kevin's like, no, I'm pr- I'm pretty sure it was you. You were wearing a jacket and everything. Jacket? That doesn't sound like me. I never wear jackets. <laughs> Kevin goes, I'm 98% sure it was you. Oh, well, there's still a 2% chance it wasn't me seriously hilarious comedic timing between the two. Yeah. Uh, but you had the matchup take place and you had Kevin Owens and Rollins emerge victorious, pinning the Usos in 10 minutes, 56 seconds. Although with some added interference from, uh, Austin theory. Duh. Yeah. Cause reasons, uh, reasons, but you did have uh, Kevin Owens and Rollins emerge victorious and hell of a main event. Yeah. It definitely caps off the show in a nice way. Like I say, they were trying to really turn the narrative back from the Mandy Rose controversy into positive TV. Because, I mean, they did kind of have this lingering around, too, on SmackDown as well. I mean, SmackDown was yeah. solid. Uh, the only thing I had complained about SmackDown is the masked intruder that uh, attacked oh, Liv Morgan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they didn't show who it was on screen. They did it for uh, the digital content. Mm-hmm. And it turned out to be Zia Lee. Oh, okay. Yeah, which I was like, yeah, which I was like, okay, this is kind of interesting because yeah. I mean, obviously, there's they're setting up some things heading into Royal Rumble season, right? But, but I thought overall, I thought they bounced back nice with two good shows that are definitely going to carry through, obviously, the holiday season, and right. then obviously we start heading to the Royal Rumble as soon as we get to January. Uh, the thing I should note too is after you had the main event on Raw, Sami Zayn was at ringside. He did enter the ring with Kevin Owens cel- celebrating. Uh, he had his back turned. Owens did notice Sammy and took off his wrist tape, but Sam, they did and they did kind of lock eyes for a minute. But uh, Sammy left the ring and regrouped with the Bloodline. So they are still teasing the old reunion between Owens and Sammy. I'm telling you right now, it's going to be in Montreal and that place is going to explode. Oh my God, it's going to be it's going to be one of the loudest pops you're ever going to hear in pro wrestling. Please. That being said, hit us up on the hashtag hashtag ODPHPod. What is your thoughts about the Mandy Rose controversy? And what's your thoughts about the current state of the WWE? Thought they had two really good shows going into the holiday week. And obviously next week's Monday Night Raw is going to be a best of. So we're not expecting anything live. But nope. we do know that there's a big, big smackdown with John Cena. Bah, 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 bah. Wrestling with Kevin Owens to take on Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn. Yep. That'll be a fun match. So we'll definitely be talking about that as it's coming on. But in the meantime, hit us up on that hashtag. And also remember to head over to odphpodcast.com and make your voice heard for the 2022 Brody Awards because that award show will be taking place the first show of the new year on January 3rd. So you definitely want to make sure you're subscribing to 607 TWS and get your voice heard and then hear who won the prestigious awards. That said, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Couples Conversation Podcast. My name is JT. My name is Madison. And this podcast is exactly what it's titled. It is a couple having a conversation. We talk about life, we play games, and we love to make each other laugh, giving you a reason to laugh too. Exactly. We record every Sunday and publish our episodes every Monday, so you can find us on every major streaming platform that you find podcasts. Apple, Anchor, Spotify, wherever you can find us. We hope that you enjoy these episodes. If you want to have a say in our episodes, you can send us a question by hitting us up on Twitter at ccpodcast underscore 22. We love to see you there. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, what you got? Got to talk a little local minute, uh, obviously, because looking at the Federal Hockey, Federal Prospects Hockey League, excuse me, uh, which is the league our Binghamton Black Bears play in, uh, in the Empire Division, still in second place. Danbury still in first place with a record of 16-1-2. Binghamton in second place with a record of 14-5-2, so playing very well uh, in the standings there. And looking at their schedule for games this past week, they did have a game on 
on Friday uh, at home against the Watertown Wolves, where they lost by the final score of 5-2. to two. Uh, And then Saturday, they were on the road playing with the Delaware Thunder, where they won by the final score of, listen to this one, 8-4. to four. Whoa. Uh, they've got a couple of games. Uh, or they got one game coming up this week because of the holiday. Uh, they play on Friday, December 23rd, 7 o'clock Eastern. Uh, that is at home against the Watertown Wolves, where it will be Ugly Sweater Jerseys Night. Hmm. Uh, and then also Santa Claus is going to be in the building. So you could definitely give a lookout for that. Uh, they then... Uh, are off until December Friday, December 30th. Uh, so this will be your last chance to see them during the holiday week before they come back next week. Uh, for more tickets, information, and all that good stuff, BinghamtonBlackBears.com. Uh, then we got to talk a little World Cup because the World Cup final did take place this past Sunday. What a game. Holy fuck, this was insane. Like, the moniker, greatest soccer game of all time, greatest football game of all time, aptly put because this was fucking nuts because at one point in the first first half so the first 45 minutes uh Arge- it was between Argentina and France Argentina of course has Lionel Messi one of if not the greatest soccer players on the planet right now uh you know 15 plus years has not won the world cup might be his last one we don't know you know he said he's coming back for the next one but going into this might be his last one mm-hmm. uh you know so at one point in the first half it was two nothing argentinas which is a mile high climb for the other team to come back from in terms of soccer football no basketball no baseball no soccer absolutely goddamn yeah soccer it's absolutely goddamn lootly so then you get into the second half, uh, and you had Mbappe, <clears throat> who was also one of the great players on the planet, one of the best players, if not the best player on France, come back, scored in the 80th minute on a penalty minute, and then literally like a minute and a half later, scored another goal to tie it up 2-2. Absolutely nuts. So they get to the end of that. They go into what's called extra time, where it's two 15-minute halves, where you had uh, Messi score another one to put... Argentina up three to two. He scored in the hundred and eighth minute. Mm-hmm. Then you had uh, Mbappe score uh, and on a penalty kick in the hundred and eighteenth minute to put them uh, to tie it up three three. So they, all in all, these two teams went uh, all over two hours uh, and That's tie, wild. tied it up three three. So they went to penalty kicks where Argentina won on four to two in terms of penalty kicks, finally getting a world cup. It was basically the only uh, award Messi had left to win. Yeah. He's won basically every other major award in, in soccer around the world. You can, but an awesome game to watch. Holy shit. This, it was a hell of a game to watch. I'm glad I got the chance to watch it. Yeah, no, this is always a fun time to watch. Like I say, we're, we're not the biggest soccer fans sure. here. I know you're getting more into I'm, it than I'm get, I am. I'm getting into it. Yeah, which, I mean, listen, it's it's very cool to sit and watch the World Cup because I always get excited about that Yeah, because there's just a different energy. I don't know what it is, but right. like watching like from MLS, you know, the Major League Soccer that we have here in the States, yep. it's just not the same vibe. No. But the World Cup is like just every game just feels like monumental. Yeah. And I love watching that. Yeah, and the video that it's awesome, it's making the rounds. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's of, and I'm looking it up right now, there is an Argentinian-born uh, announcer who called the game for the Argentina TV broadcast or whatever. His name is Andres Cantor. Uh, he is a native from Argentina, grew up here in the States. If you have not seen the video, it's like a Sony, It's like a camera was set up on the call board, though, of him calling the Argentina win. It is probably the most emotional thing you'll see this week mm-hmm. because the man is near tears. Yeah. Highly recommend you check out the video. It's awesome to watch. Uh, and then got to talk some baseball deals because we did have some of those go down. Uh, not like Again, not all the deals, but kind of the major ones. Uh, you had Noah Syndergaard sign a one-year $13 million deal with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Hmm. Uh, it makes sense for him. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you had Carlos Rodon sign with the New York Yankees for a six-year $162 million deal, making him their number two starter because, hey, let's face it. We need one. We need one. Uh, listen, I realize they have some other issues to address, but listen, that, bolt, that starting rotation will – once you got past Nestor Cortez and Garrett Cole, it was kind of suspect at best, but th- mm. this helps anchor it down and gives them a really lethal starting rotation, might I add. It's a, it's a very big arm to add that yeah. they desperately needed. Just a couple more tweaks, and then yeah. I'll tell you what, the team's looking real good. Also, his stats against the Astros, all I need to say. Yep. Uh, you had Andrew Benatendi sign a five-year, $75 million deal with the Chicago White Sox. Reasons. Should be noted, <laughs> this is the largest Chicago White Sox con- free agency contract in history. So that's all you need to say about their, yeah. about their owner. I'm leaving it alone. 
Uh, Justin Turner, the third baseman, signed a two-year, $21.7 million deal with the Boston Red Sox. Oh, leaving L.A. there. Leaving L.A., going to Boston. Interesting. Uh, shipping up to Boston, one might say. Uh, and then this one, this one, not a big one, but for as good as he was for the Yankees, this one hurt a little bit. Matt Carpenter signed a two-year, $12 million deal with the San Diego Padres. Hey, good for him. Sucks to see him go, though. Yeah, but you know what? We have some bats in the farm system that this are true. ready to come up. Like for, for where Carpenter is at There's this a stage. Martian. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I am bittersweet about it, too, with you, Pat. Like, it's a big yeah. thing, but it's not like yeah. monumental, right? You know, it wouldn't be like Judge going out west. Oh God! Which you know, by the way, folks, officially done. Yeah, it's officially done deal. He's, he's in the Bronx. Yep. Just want to put everybody press conference coming to coming on Wednesday. They had better give him the C. Give him the captain. I imagine they'll announce it at the press conference. They, they better, damn it. Speaking of New York sports, let us talk some NBA action. And Pat, here's a question for you. Okay. Who is the hottest team in the NBA right now? Brooklyn Nets. No, sir. Los Angeles Lakers. Nope. Houston Rockets. Nope. Detroit Pistons. Nope. I'm running through all the bad teams. Uh, Charlotte Hornets. No. Uh, Oklahoma City Thunder. No. Close. Okay. I give up. The New York Knicks. Hey, go New York. Go New York. Oh, my God. I did not believe they were doing this well. See, like, usually... The Knicks are kind of hovering around 500 as we go into the Christmas Day lineup. Because one thing, if you're not familiar with the NBA, it feels that Christmas Day is when the season really kicks off. Like, obviously, there's opening night. But by this time, you kind of know who's a contender and who's a pretender. And this year, there's a pretty stacked lineup for New Year's Day. Or, I'm sorry, not New Year's Day, Christmas Day. Christmas Day, yeah, there is. Uh, So at 12 o'clock Eastern on ABC, ESPN, and ESPN+, Plus, you have the Philadelphia 76ers taking on the New York Knicks in New York. Uh, At 2.30 p.m. Eastern on ABC and ESPN, you have the Los Angeles Lakers taking on the Dallas Mavericks in Dallas. At 5 p.m. Eastern on ABC and ESPN, and I should note, these are the start times I'm giving. Given the fact they're all on the same network, some of those times are subject to change based on how long the game before them goes. Yeah. So bear that in mind. Uh, You have the Milwaukee Bucks taking on the Boston Celtics in Boston. That's going to be the marquee game. 8 o'clock, you have the Memphis Grizzlies taking on the Golden State Warriors in Golden State. Uh, And then closing out the night at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, you have the Phoenix Suns taking on the Denver Nuggets in Denver. Phoenix and Denver will be a fun game, especially now it's getting rumored that the new owner, the new owner is taking over in Phoenix. <laughs> Worth like $5 billion. Yeah, so that's breaking as we're, we're going on to air here. So be interesting to see what this goes. Matt Aishba yep. uh, is going to be the new owner for $4 billion. Yeah, Yeah, I would say he's buying the team for $4 billion. Uh, According to a Forbes article I saw, dude's worth like $5.1 billion. Yeah, so Oof. he's going all in about this. Hey, more power to him. So this is a very big deal. And for the Phoenix Suns, I mean, they're going to be a contender for a while. They're a very young team. Yeah. Memphis is nothing to sneeze at. They're number one in the Western Conference right now. And you take a look at the East, though. I mean, breaking down the the top six teams, Milwaukee and, and Boston are separated by a, a half game right? for best record. Yep. Cleveland is up there flying under a lot of radars. Donovan Mitchell, obviously, yep. leaving Utah, coming there was a big move that they needed. Only two games out. Yeah. Brooklyn is three and a half games out, but like I say, they are on a six-game winning streak. Yeah. Then you have Philly, yep, which is four and a half back, and then at that number six spot, the New York Knicks seven-game winning streak and counting. Only five games out. Yeah, and this is just astonishing because the Knicks we always know have the talent. Can they put it together on the floor? They haven't really been able to. Not since the 90s. Not, not, or 2013. Well, you thought that a couple of years ago we were making the strides. Yeah. And then last season, yeah. things did not go well, well. Things were held together with duct tape and a dream. Yeah. Kemba Walker did not produce as we all thought he was going to, being the big free agency signing. The young talent that they have with Obi Toppin and IQ are, were supposed to take over. And I don't know if it just didn't mesh with Thibodeau's system that he has right. in place there. But now... The guy that's really put the team on his back is Jalen Brunson. Uh, Yeah, currently averaging 20.8 points per game, 3.2 rebounds per game, and 6.2 assists per game. Yeah, he has really stepped his game up. They're looking phenomenal, and I'm super excited to see what this team is going to do. And also, Julius Randle is playing like the Julius Randle of two seasons ago. Averaging 22.5 points per game, 9.1 rebounds a game, and 3.6 assists per game. Yeah. 
this is the team that we're waiting to see. And they can hang with the, the elite of the Eastern Conference. Am I going to say that they're going to win the chip? Well, as a belligerent Knicks fan, yes. <laughs> yes, I am. But realistically, I am interested to see how long they can keep this momentum going. Yeah, I'll just read off some of the scores during this win streak. Uh, so they started the win streak beating Cleveland 92-81, to uh, Atlanta 113-89, to Charlotte 121-102, to Sacramento 112 to 99. That was big game too. Chicago 128 to 120 in overtime. Uh and then Chicago again, uh the first game was on Wednesday. This uh, game was on a Friday. Uh they beat the, the Bulls on Friday uh by the final score of 114 to 91 and then most recently on Sunday they beat the Pacers 109 to 106. And they got a tough game tonight. Golden State's at the Garden. I'll say they got Golden State at the Garden and then I'm looking at their schedule. They've got the Toronto Raptors uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, or so Wednesday, excuse me, Wednesday. So they can definitely put together some more wins. Do I think they're going to go on like a crazy win streak? Well, as a belligerent Knicks fan. Lakers look out. They're coming for that record. You never know. Or, or no, sorry, it's the Warriors now. Right. But no, but I think in all honesty, this team is actually showing me signs of life, which I want to see. Like I say, they have such a good young nucleus. Yeah. And RJ is RJ. If he played more consistent, I'd be more happy. Sure. But it is what it is. But from what I'm seeing right now, they're finally gelling. Like, this is the team that we've been waiting two years to see. Right. And granted, they're winning ugly in certain games. The Sacramento game was a great game. That, I think that really kind of showed what they had. But the Chicago back-to-back ones. Right. Even though Chicago is not the, not good at all, it still showed that the Knicks can find a way to win and scrap. And that's what they're going to need to do if they're going to hang with the East. Because right now, if you look at that top six lineup of who's on win streaks, yeah, five of those teams have two plus win streaks going right now. Right. Well, and, and you got to know too, a lot of teams from the Atlantic Conference, uh, the Atlantic Division, I should say, in the Eastern Conference are in the playoffs. You got the Boston Celtics at the two, Brooklyn Nets at the four, 76ers at the five, and the Knicks at the six, and even the Raptors are knocking on the door at ten. Yeah. Good God. Because this year they're doing or they're continuing to do that whole play in play in tournament, system, yeah, which yeah. is confusing as all blazes. But basically all we need to know is 7 through 10 are going to play each other. The 7 through 10 are going to play each other on the third Tuesday in the month of March. Yeah, so what would we chalk that up to, Pad? Reasons. Reasons. So that being said, it'll be a fun thing to watch. And going into the holiday games, this is always a fun time, even if you're not a super big NBA fan, to just tune in the games and watch because everybody really starts showing out. Everybody really takes it up a different notch because – there's nothing else going on sports wise. No, except this year there's like a little NFL there's, there's action. A, there's a couple of NFL games. Yeah, but usually they avoid this, and this is just well, the NBA. I, th- day. I think it's just because the fact that uh, the uh, the day Christmas Day falls on a Sunday this year. Uh, yeah. The only games you have. So we mentioned the NFL. You've got the Packers taking on the Dolphins at one o'clock on Fox. Uh, four thirty p.m. on CBS. You've got the Broncos taking on the Rams, and then eight twenty on NBC. You've got the Buccaneers taking on the Cardinals. Yeah, so there's a lot of options to watch on Sunday, in between Christmas dinners. So yeah. you can, you can definitely make some time to check out some of the great sports action. And if you're a Knicks fan, you have to be excited. Like I say, Coach Duffy isn't here. He's probably still trying to you know sneak onto the coaching staff. There, we've heard rumors. Maybe we'll get a more of an update sooner than later. But right now, with what, what this team is doing, and the big thing is Brunson has played up to that contract. I know it was big money to bring him in. Yeah. He's really living up to it. So I feel very solid with him running at the top of the key. And then it all depends on if Randall can stay consistent. If we get the Randall of two years ago, we're going to make a run. Not going to say we're going to get it, but we're going to make a run. Right. And as long as they don't do anything super crazy at the trade deadline, I think we're okay. That's the only thing that worries me because now the team is playing well. Mm. That they'll go, oh well, if we decide to go trade all our very young talent for somebody that's on the bubble, like a Russell Westbrook or somebody like oh, that, God. like that would be something the Knicks would do. Yeah, maybe that's why. Well, let me rephrase this: this would be something Dolan would do, <laughs> not necessarily the Knicks, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we all know it'd be Dolan. Yeah, so as long as hey, the Rangers, if the Rangers are playing good, Dolan's happy. Speaking of that, love the segue. Who else is on fire right now? For the first time since like the 90s. No, no. I well, w- no, I mean the two teams at the same time. Yes, the two teams at the same time because I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the last time this happened, the Rangers went to the Cup. Yes, they did. Uh, they went to the Cup and then the uh, Knicks also went to the Finals. So and I I'm will, talking NBA Finals, not Eastern fi- Conference Finals. Right. So I will take this because one of the hottest teams in the NHL right now is those New York Rangers who got on fire 
after December 3rd. Jesus Christ. And are currently on a seven-game win streak of their own. Currently beating the Pittsburgh Penguins as we record tonight, one to nothing. I will take that. But they have been scoring goals like crazy with the exception of two games. Right. Because they went to overtime and uh, won the shootout. But the past two games, they put up a combined 13 goals. Uh, seven of them being in the game on Sunday against the Chicago Blackhawks. Yes, which there's a great story on ESPN.com about that. And, and uh, Emily Kaplan wrote it. And basically breaking down about how this team got fired up. And Jacob Truba, who is the captain, wasn't originally my pick to be captain. But listen, if he's doing stuff like this and it's getting the team motivated, I'm cool with this. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of him but I because I thought I should have gone to Kreider. But he got ejected from the game. Or he you know, got into two big fights, and yeah, so as he's sitting there, he starts screaming at the bench, wake the F up. Mm-hmm. That's what you need to do as captain. Yeah. Like, you can't sit there and just let everything just ride. You have to rile that team up. You have to get them motivated. And that set them off, which I think kept uh, their head coach's job. And I think that this really set Perfect. a precedent for what they needed to do. So, like I say, if we see more of this out of the Rangers, and this is starting to remind me of the team that got in the playoffs and got hot, I will graciously take that without question. And I'm going to say, obviously, Blue Shirts Nation stand the puck up. It's it's Rangers town every day and all day over here. And if they beat the Penguins tonight, I will probably get a little belligerent on social media. I'm just going to put that out there. But it's a great time to be a New York sports fan. And it's a great time to just be into hockey now because now the season, everything feels like it's fully on the way. Yeah. Does it mean it's just me or what are you feeling about this? Pat? I'm not feeling the same way. It's feeling like a good, a good time to be a sports fan. Yeah, so it's a good time to be a sports fan, especially the winter sports are carrying on. The World Cup is done. The yep. NFL season's winding down. Yep. Basketball and hockey are in full swing, and obviously we're 100 days away from baseball being back in yeah. action. Yeah. What a time to be here. It's a good time. What a time to be on a sports podcast. So that being said, if you want more ODPH content, it's very simple. Swing on over to odphpodcast.com. Join the conversations, and if it's anything and everything that we do here, whether it's Patreon, T Public. Parlay Points blog section, directory, classified, music section, you name it. If it's ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's all for this week. For the one and only Padawan J. Fuck the Astros. And happy birthday, Liz. I'm your host, Ken M. Happy holidays, everyone. Please be safe. Please be healthy. And we'll see you next time here on the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideroom Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one